Hello and welcome to From Rewatch with Love, a James Bond cinematic rewatch podcast. My name is Graham Stark and joining me as always is Matt Wiggins. Hello. And today we are looking at 1989's License to Kill. License spelt with two C's the British way. I, I could never tell if it's like, is that legitimately the British way? I always sort of assumed that it was the difference between the noun and the verb. Apparently they had some back and forth during production about how they were going to spell it. And they decided to settle on this way, which is the British way, because James Bond is British. Which makes sense. Yeah. For whatever reason, I thought it was like the two C's is the noun, a license to kill. And if you are licensed in an action, that is the S. That is always how I've conceived it in my mind. But perhaps I'm wrong. Perhaps it's just actually like colloquial spelling. Anyhow... <laughs> Tell us more about this movie, however it is spelled. So this would be Timothy Dalton's last Bond movie, and indeed the last Bond movie for six years because of nothing really to do with the Bond production company themselves, but because of legal and financial troubles with MGM and United Artists. And honestly, I guess it makes more sense to get into that at the beginning of next episode when we talk about Goldeneye. But for now, this is a real sort of end of an era again. This is the last one that John Glenn would direct. This is the last one where Maurice Binder would do the opening titles because he passed away in 1991. This is the last one that Richard Maybaum would be involved in scripting because he also passed away in the early 90s. I mean, it's not like there's a hard changing of the guard at any point in the Bond franchise. We sort of talked about that before. There's a lot of bleed over with different people. Right. Made on a budget of $32 million, $1989, or about $67 million today. Our budgets are deflating. They are. Still walking away with a respectable $156 million, or $326.9 million adjusted. So certainly not a box office failure, but controversial the reaction to this movie and it's funny because i've just been listening to last episode which i'm working on the edit of and i talk about sort of what our expectations yours and mine right for a james bond movie and how we're we're just sort of like whatever you know let it wash over us this is all james bond movies and <laughs> this one's really interesting I think the most tonally divergent movie we've seen so far. From the franchise as a whole? I think so. Like, if you asked me to give you the elevator pitch of how I feel about this movie is that I really enjoyed it and it's great and it's a good example of a mid-late 80s action movie, specifically like an action revenge story, but rarely in its two-hour, ten-minute runtime does it feel like a James Bond movie. I had the same thought. Like, this movie basically rules in every regard, except the regard of being a Bond movie. <laughs> yeah, it's so unusual. Like, there's the pre-title, which I mean, we'll get to any second, and then the opening titles. And then after that, there's a period of an hour plus where I'm like, this is awesome, but what is happening? <laughs> yeah, I think this movie is a little bit tonally inconsistent internally as well. Like, I, I came to this with the thought going through my head is like, this movie's a real mixed bag. Mm -hmm. It's more awesome than not, but it almost can't help itself in trying to do certain James Bondy things, despite the fact that the whole movie is trying to tell a different kind of story than most of James Bond's stories. And instead of like committing to what they're trying to do they still try to roll a few things into the movie and when they do that it plays so goofy compared to what the rest of the movie is doing mm -hmm. it almost feels like tonal whiplash but there's so much of this movie that's great <laughs> <laughs> yeah and it's funny because like it has a bit of a reputation as being along the lines of like ohmss this has a reputation as being one of the bad ones and i don't think it is if you had asked me prior to doing this podcast which one i thought was timothy dalton's better movie it would be living daylights easy no contest and now having watched them both back to back and really been thinking about it i'm not sure that's actually true but it depends a little bit on like which is the better movie versus which is the better bond film <laughs> yeah and it's weird because it's like anytime we say something like generally regarded right like this movie was generally regarded as being a little too dark or a little off 
message of being James Bond, invariably people, or rather assuredly, people will say, <laughs> where are you getting this impression from? That's not true. This movie's great and it's awesome and it's everything I want out of a Bond film. And that's sweet. But the fact is, this movie w was not well received comparative to other Bond films because there's just a lot in here that's sort of not what audiences expect from a James Bond film. And we might get things wrong, like Richard Marquand directed Return of the Jedi, or that there's 12 years, not 22 years, between OHMSS and For Your Eyes Only. I will never mix up Norway and Sweden again. <laughs> And people are keen and happy to correct us on those things, and that's cool. But this movie is undeniably very different in feeling, even to the last movie, which was clearly a James Bond movie with an edgier tone. But I think you're right in that both of them do suffer from what I assume is John Glenn's hand of <laughs> interior tonal inconsistency. <laughs> yeah. An interesting aside, the script was co-written by Richard Maybaum and Michael G. Wilson again, but there was also a WGA strike partway through production, meaning that Richard Maybaum, who was in the Writers Guild, had to excuse himself from the remainder of the production, leaving Michael G. Wilson to finish the script by himself. Right. I don't know that that necessarily speaks to any of that, but he does talk about taking a lot of inspiration from... Kurosawa's Yojimbo. Interesting. Specifically, the notion of the samurai doesn't actually raise his sword. He just sows distrust from within. Right. That comes up in this movie, and I do quite like yeah. that. But I figured it was worth mentioning that anyway. And I mean, the director obviously is a big part of it. John Glenn considers this his best Bond film. And again, <laughs> I think this movie <laughs> rules. It's just that I was sitting there going like, there's so much of this that doesn't feel like a Bond movie. Even with yeah. how much Q there is in this movie, which I love. <laughs> yeah. As I say, a real mixed bag. This movie runs the gamut from, like, fully grim. Actually just grim. Yeah, holy hell. Not gritty, not edgy, just grim. To Bond gets attacked by a guy using a swordfish as a sword. <laughs> 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 like, this movie is wild. And, man, the stunt work in this movie is off the friggin' chain. Easily the best stunt work we've seen in a Bond movie to date. No contest. It's so good. <laughs> So let us begin then. Immediately, it is obvious that John Barry is not doing the score because just under the gun barrel sequence, there is a difference to how the main James Bond theme sounds. Right. That's the first thing I was struck with when the movie started was like, oh, this sounds different. Yeah. Before the Bond theme even starts, there's like a big orchestral hit <laughs> that we've never heard anything like up to this point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it struck me too. It, it is a, like a big difference right out of the gate. The first thing we see in the movie is one of those funky planes with the big disc on it. I, it's, it's a Northrop Grumman E2 Hawkeye. All right. According to the Internet Movie Plane Database, it's used by the Navy for surveillance. Right. It's like a big radar apparatus or sensor apparatus in the disc on top of it, right? Yeah. We cut inside and the U.S. Navy is triangulating the position for a much smaller plane a Learjet 35, since I still have the page open, <laughs> landing on an area somewhere in the Florida Keys. And then we cut to that big, long bridge that you've seen in like a bajillion movies that take place in and around Florida. You've seen it in True Lies. Yeah. It's the Florida Keys Highway, which is like the primary location for the entire third act of True Lies. <laughs> I'm pretty sure if you're seeing any Michael Bay movie, it's got a 50-50 chance that this will be in the, there as well. <laughs> and there are some cars on it, and we cut to inside one of the cars, and there are three men dressed in gray suits with white carnations and top hats that they're holding on to, and they're heading to a wedding. And they are James Bond, Felix Leiter, and their friend Sharky. And Felix Leiter, as I mentioned way back in Live and Let Die, which I don't know, probably 68 years ago, <laughs> who can say really, is played by David Hedison, the same guy who played Felix Leiter in Live and Let Die. And that's just so odd to me. It's so good, though. He's so good. He's so good. He's so likable. And I really, uh, I feel bad for Felix. 
I'm happy that he's back because I don't even remember the actor's name who played Felix in The Living Daylights made zero impression on me. So I'm really glad that he's back. It fully makes sense that they would bring back a Felix for this movie, Mm -hmm. like any Felix, right? Like if they had really had their junk together, they would have done the same thing for Felix that they had done with all the other characters, which is have continuity of Felix through these movies. Yeah. To the extent that there would only have been like one cast change of Felix to this point, because like what they're about to do to Felix in this movie, spoilers, In order to be particularly emotionally impactful, they really do need to have a character who has some emotional attachment from the audience. So going back to one of the more beloved recent Roger Moore outings and pulling a Felix from that makes sense just so that you've got some familiarity there. They're not dropping a new actor into the role. Yeah, I just wish he'd had a chance to also play him in Living Daylights. I think that would have intensified the forthcoming gut punch. Yeah. The third man here, Sharky, who is their friend. This is just established as their friend. We don't know who he is. He's a new guy, but he's their friend, played by Frank McRae, a former NFL player and very large man. He's played a lot of characters over the years. He's definitely, I mean, he's in a movie coming out next year, but particularly up until the 2000s was definitely a working character actor. He he was in Rocky II playing a meat foreman at like a packing plant, but I want to assume that the character's name was meet foreman (laughs) he has the look of someone that would play somebody called meet foreman so felix asks bond to make sure that he has the rings which bond does so just that little exchange establishes that they're on their way to felix lighter's wedding when a coast guard helicopter flies up beside them with a giant handwritten sign in the window that says follow me so they do with Felix catching up with a couple of DEA agents in that Coast Guard helicopter, we are intercut with shots of Franz Sanchez, who will be the bad guy for this movie, and his goon squad busting into someone's house somewhere in Miami. So the DEA, they rush up to Felix. They're like, Sanchez is here. He's in Miami. We've spotted him. It's established through a very quick conversation that this is someone that Felix has been after for a long time. And the fact that he is suddenly within jurisdiction where they can actually arrest him is huge. So Felix is like, all right, I'm going to go do this. You tell Della that I'll be late to the wedding. And Bond is like, absolutely not. I'm coming with you. (laughs) So they both peace out and go, all right, Sharky, you tell Della we'll be late to the wedding. And he's like, no, what? Damn you guys. So they take off in the Coast Guard helicopter. And the reason Sanchez is here is that his mistress is cheating on him with somebody in Florida. The mistress is Lupe, played by Talisa Soto, who would go on to play Kitana in both Mortal Kombat movies. And some other things as well, but I thought it was okay. amusing to mention that because there's <laughs> there's another Mortal Kombat actor later in this movie. <laughs> so Sanchez and his goons bust into the house where Lupe and this poor man are sleeping. And there's a great shot where Sanchez rips down like mosquito netting around the bed or something. And the lights come up on him and we see this great shot of Franz Sanchez, played by Robert Davi, who is so good. Oh, yeah. Robert Davi has been in so many things and continues to be in so many things. At no point has Robert Davi ever stopped working. He was in Die Hard. He was in The Goonies. He will be in The Goonies 2. They're making a Goonies 2? How did you not know that? (laughs) Truth be told, it's because I'm not that into The Goonies. He was in a movie called Night Trap, which is not of the video game. <laughs> he's the voice of Colonel Juan Cortez in GTA Vice City. Yeah. He's he's done a lot of video game voices as well. He was in Stargate Atlantis. He's been in so many things, not always playing similar characters, but frequently playing characters similar to Sanchez. The IMDb page is just packed full. Well, I'm glad he's getting work cuz he's He's really good. He instructs his goon squad to take the man outside and cut out his heart. He tells Lupe, if you want his heart so bad, we'll cut it out for you, basically. And then he sits down with her and, you know, does the like, well, why? I give you so much stuff. Why would you do this to me? Well, you know what has to happen now. And she sort of goes, yeah, and lays across his knee as he pulls out this violent looking leather switch and whips her with it. Grim! Yeah. 
Although he did say in the DVD interviews that he's, I'm trying to paraphrase what he said, but it's like, you don't fully appreciate the kind of subcultures you're going to start appealing to until you start getting all the fan mail. Oh, no. And apparently this scene in particular, if this movie was made today, there would be hashtag Robert Daddy on Twitter. All right. Fair enough. Yeah. People were like, dang, he can really whip a butt. (laughs) In the scene, it's not particularly consensual, which I believe is uh, a a big part of um, making that cool. But yeah, he does repeatedly whip Lupe with this switch. Later, we will see the wounds he is inflicting here, which do not physically line up with it's they're perpendicular to where they should be. Yeah. I mean, they, they show up across the small of Lupe's back and he is clearly whipping the butt. But also like vertically. Yes. But when we see the wounds, they're horizontal. Yes. Why I focus on that. Zero out of ten. Literally unwatchable. Yeah. Somebody needs to fire the continuity person. What were they thinking? We cut back to the wedding and Sharky is looking very nervous. The limo pulls up and he pokes his head inside and is like, you want to maybe go around the block again? And Della is looking more and more distraught. Her dad looks supremely pissed off. He's like, I told you this was a bad idea. Sanchez and his squad now see that the Coast Guard helicopter has picked up on them, so they head back to their airstrip. Sanchez dives out of the Jeep that they're driving so he can make his own quick escape. There's an amazing shot of the two DEA agents with their rifles and Felix also with a rifle, but still in his suit, like (laughs) running. It, It looks like it should be in slow motion, but like running through the heat of Florida with the downwash of the helicopter. Right. Oh, it is in slow motion. I'm sorry. The shot is actually in slow motion. It's a very silly shot, actually. I like it, but it's, yeah. So they get Sanchez's private jet, but he's not there. And they realize that he's escaped from the Jeep. Bond is still waiting in the helicopter at this point. And as they realize that he's like not in the plane, the guys who are still in the Jeep open fire and they open fire at the helicopter first. So Bond gets a bullet hole in his hat. This causes Bond to enter the fight. The helicopter takes off. Bond is still in the helicopter. The DEA agents and Felix open fire on the Jeep. The Jeep takes off like it goes and is just trying to sort of breed chaos and destruction. But Bond manages to jump out of the helicopter and bait them around and shoots out the engine block of the Jeep, causing it to crash. So he ends up approaching the Jeep, which all the goons have gone running away from, but Lupe is still sitting in the Jeep. And so he goes over to talk to her and she just tells him to go away. While this is happening, Felix and the DEA agents are still on the warpath trying to collect the goons. When another plane revs up and starts to fly away, and they all immediately realize that this is Sanchez, has commandeered this other plane. They run towards it just in time to see it taxi to the runway and initiate its takeoff. This is a Cessna 172P Skyhawk. I still have the page open. I gathered. (laughs) So they call the helicopter down and they all hop aboard and they're like, all right, we're going to chase that plane in this helicopter. And we get what I would describe as the first rad stunt (laughs) as Sanchez takes the plane off and banks so hard off the end of the runway that it appears at least that he skims the edge of his wing on the runway. (laughs) And it's just like, oh, wow, that's a hell of a piloting move. That's really impressive. (laughs) It it really is. (laughs) We see Bond in the helicopter and and like all through this, Felix has been like, no, you're just an observer. You're not allowed to participate. And Bond has been not doing that. So Felix has been ribbing him a little bit about, hey, observer, you know, get yourself together. We have things to do. But now aboard the helicopter, Bond is like, let's go fishing and straps on a parachute. And then, of course, they're on a Coast Guard helicopter, which has the little, like, hanger winch, that you know, the one that they use to pull people up, like, rescue people out of the ocean. And so he uses the carabiner and connects himself to the hanger winch. And the DEA agents in the back of this helicopter are like, what on earth are you doing? And we get this great shot of the helicopter coming up behind the plane and Bond jumping out of the helicopter on this winch wire as the helicopter like flies up behind the plane and and Bond is like, you know, lower me down, lower me down. And he ends up grabbing on to the tail of the plane and wrapping the winch cable around the fuselage of the plane behind the tail, locking the carabiner off. (laughs) 
And then the the helicopter just pulls up, causing the Cessna to tip vertically, nose down, and they just drag this plane out of the air. (laughs) It's so good. It's so not possible, but it's so good. Oh, man, like everything in this scene is so good that like there are some great reverse shots that are clearly like the plane is on the ground and you're looking up from the the tail of the plane as the helicopter is just hovering over a stationary plane dangling Timothy Dalton. Yeah, but there are some wide shots that are just incredible. Apparently, when Timothy Dalton was on set for those scenes, he was like, oh, I want to do the whole thing. I want you to lower me out of the helicopter and everything. And Cubby Broccoli arrives on set and looks up at the helicopter stunt and then looks over and sees that the stunt man is standing there watching and then looks back and sees that it's actually Dalton. And he's like, <laughs> what, do you, what am I paying you for if the star is up there doing the stunt? <laughs> Hanging out of an Aerospatial HH-65A Dolphin. I'm just not closing this page now. Anyhow, the the helicopter then just dragging this plane behind it flies over to the wedding where Bond and now Felix, who both have parachutes on, skydive off the helicopter and the plane respectively, making a grand entrance at Felix's wedding as they they parachute out of the sky. Oh, my God. What a way to make an entrance. Yeah. My favorite part of this moment is as they're going inside and it transitions to the opening titles, the bridesmaids sort of look at one another and go, oh, you know what we should do? And they start gathering up (laughs) Bond's and Felix's parachutes as if they're trains. Yeah. They're like, oh, we should carry your parachute into the church for the wedding. (laughs) So that was great. That whole scene was great and felt very James Bond, despite the stuff that we said before. What a great start. Yeah. The whole opening of this movie just slaps. (laughs) It's so good. We move to the opening titles with the song License to Kill performed by Gladys Knight. This is definitely a belter. Oh, yeah. And it's pretty good. Yeah. To the song's credit, one thing I really like is a lot of this song is actually pretty mellow. It's not like a ripping tune from beginning to end. Mm -hmm. In terms of energy, it ebbs and flows, but it starts with a really good hit, right? Like that bah, bah, right out of the gate. Yeah. Which the the energy of the transition from what we have just seen into this song is really good. Mm -hmm. It doesn't undercut or suck the wind out of it or anything. It doesn't upstage it. It's just like, oh, okay, cool. We're in the title credits now. The song, otherwise, pretty good. It takes a while to get to the hook, but it's nice to have that little chance to relax out of the high action we've just seen. So I quite like this song, and I quite like this song's place in this film. Yeah, I enjoy it. The opening titles themselves, Binder's playing around with some motion graphics, and there's a lot of silhouettes again. This feels like a bit of a step backward for Binder's work. Like this doesn't feel as fresh and modern as even View to a Kill. It feels like a step up from The Living Daylights, though. It does. It does (laughs) that, yeah. There's like some little thematics in this one. It's not too on the nose. It's mostly dancing ladies. Mm Mm-hmm. But there's like a little sort of motif of casino chips and film and cameras and they're doing a photography thing. I appreciate at least that they have picked up a a theme. We entered the opening titles going through the circle of a camera aperture. And at the end of the titles, we go back out through a camera aperture to where they are continuing to arrest Sanchez. What I found really threw me is that the scene after the opening titles is just the next scene chronologically. It's like it follows immediately after the pre-title. Yeah, it continues on from what we have just seen. (laughs) Before we move into the interrogation, the seizure pier is great. The scene, (laughs) their establishing shot. Yeah. We have a Coast Guard boat docked at a seizure pier next to a small building The Coast Guard helicopter that we just saw is now landed on top of the Coast Guard ship. And the Cessna plane is still vertical, leaned up against the side of the customs building (laughs) with its tail in the air. (laughs) And there's a bunch of people milling around it, ostensibly like trying to get Sanchez out of the plane. So the scene is Sanchez in like the quintessential question room with the single ceiling light 
being questioned by a member of the DEA and... I'm not sure what law enforcement the other guy is. The DEA guy is Hawkins, who's one of the guys that we saw with Felix making the takedown, played by Grand L. Bush, who has been in a bunch of other stuff. He was in Die Hard. Actually, it's funny. He was in Die Hard as Little Johnson, and Robert Davi was Big Johnson. (laughs) He was also Balrog in Street Fighter. Wow, we're really digging deep on the adaptations of fighting games, aren't we? I, I guess. And then the other guy who is obviously a member of some sort of law enforcement, and I don't know if he's also CIA like Felix. Felix knows who he is. I assume he's also CIA. Yeah, it's established that they have history together. He's just spearheading the investigation while Felix is off getting married like some slacker would do. (laughs) Yeah. And so his name is Killifer, played by Everett McGill who, among a handful of other roles, plays Big Ed Hurley in Twin Peaks. Okay. So Sanchez is clearly a character very much from real life. They talked at the time about how he was a Bond villain ripped from the headlines. This is how they marketed it in 1989. Right. I mean, he's inspired a lot by Manuel Noriega. He is a Central American drug lord. And in that same sort of vein... Part of this scene is he's being dressed down by Killifer, basically being like, bribes don't work here. You don't get to do that anymore. You don't get to just say, oh, I'll pay you a million dollars and you can bust me out of jail, which, you know, that's the sort of trope of the incredibly powerful connected drug lord is that they never go to jail because if they ever do get arrested, they just bribe someone on the inside and get out and escape. Sanchez responds to that by saying two million. <laughs> and there's this shot of Hawkins where it looks like he's almost considering this, but Killifer shuts it down. He's like, no, no, that's not how this goes. He gets really angry at Sanchez, too. He starts like he lashes out and actually like attacks him because Sanchez is basically like threatening him. He's like, look, I'm going to get out of here. And then, you know, then what's going to happen? Yeah, you're both dead or you can take my money. Yeah, it's funny because this is an interrogation scene, but they're really setting the dynamics of the characters in this scene because it is very clear who is in control of this particular interrogation. And it's neither of the cops. Yeah. Sanchez does not look at all concerned about his situation. He doesn't seem to be winning, but he is not remotely worried, despite the relatively high tensions on the other side of the room. Mm -hmm. We cut back to the wedding reception for Felix and Della, and Della's hanging out with James. Della has apparently, look, I don't want to judge, but apparently the relationship between James and Della extends to kissing on the mouth, as happens multiple times. They're really, really good friends. Boy, they sure are. Maybe there is more to this relationship than we're aware, but all we see is that she kisses Bond on the lips multiple times in these scenes. And I was like, that seems odd, but whatever. She tells James to go and get Felix because it's time to cut the cake. And James finds Felix in his home office, which is a separate building from the main. This This is a nice house, too. It's this huge place. Yeah, it is. James walks in and sees that Felix is just finishing a meeting. (laughs) (laughs) this guy sounds infuriating to be in a relationship with (laughs) yeah he's writing his report for the takedown he's like they wanted this report yesterday so i don't even have time to go to the reception just let me save this he says yeah and then turns to the world's most ridiculous what i assume is a cd burner circa 1989 yep it's amazing (laughs) (laughs) The woman that he's meeting with, we'll find out later, is Pam Bouvier, but she's not relevant yet. Felix hands her something and she leaves, and Bond forgets that he's supposed to be getting Felix out of there. They just sit down and have a chat, and Felix is really happy to have finally made this arrest. Killifer walks in and is like, hey, congratulations, buddy. And Felix is like, thank you. Are you staying? And he's like, I got to get back to the interrogation. I just stopped by to say hello. Then Felix grabs a CD out of the CD burner and asks Bond to hand him the framed photograph of Della that he has in his office. So Bond obliges. He takes the CD and he stuffs it into the frame behind the picture. Why he does this doesn't matter. We assume he wants to keep it secret. Yep. Bond doesn't think it's that weird. No. I guess if you're a CIA agent, this is a fairly normal thing to do. Yeah. And upon hiding the disc, Bond hands him the knife and we cut to the cutting of the cake. Sharky gives them a box of handmade lures. Which Dylan laughs at and then is like, I'm not going fishing on my honeymoon. (laughs) No, you sure aren't. 
We cut back to the Coast Guard seizure pier as Sanchez is being led into an armored car. And there's the press there. And, you know, he's just soaking in the attention, really. The press questions. <laughs> Leave a little bit to be desired. <laughs> Mr. Sanchez, are you really a Colombian? It's one of the questions like <laughs> Sanchez is de facto in charge of a small Central American country, very much inspired by Panama, but that does not actually exist called Ithmus City. So he's not Colombian. Oh, maybe he's Colombian, but he's from Ithmus City. <laughs> right. Which again is not Panama. So with two military escort trucks, this armored car drives away. There's a driver, there's Killifer in the front seat with a gun, and there's two men in the armored car with Sanchez, also with guns. Back at the party, everyone continues to be having a good time, and Felix and Della give Bond a lighter that is inscribed, James, love always, Della and Felix. I think they might be a thruple. <laughs> it could be. I don't know. More power to him. Why not? Yeah. This lighter is over cranked. I love that. They hand him the lighter and he's like, oh, what a what a beautiful lighter. Thank you very much. Oh, the inscription on it. I'll treasure this always. Then he tests it and they all go, whoa, <laughs> <laughs> as this giant fireball erupts out of the top of the lighter. Oh, CIA standard issue. Yeah. Back in the armored car, as it crosses Seven Mile Bridge, they approach a section of the bridge where it is under repair. And as they get closer to it, Killifer, the man who minutes ago was offended at the mere notion of Sanchez bribing anyone, uses the butt of his rifle to knock out the driver of the truck, grabs the steering wheel, and heaves the truck through the under repair section of bridge and into the water. So that's how Sanchez is getting away from this. The truck goes. The back door opens up. The two guards swim up to the surface as two scuba men swim into the truck, giving Sanchez and Killifer their own scuba tanks, and they swim away underwater in a submarine. It's the like National Guard and the Coast Guard and the CIA and the DEA all on top of the bridge scrambling. No idea what's going on under the water. Later that night, Bond is clearly the last person to be leaving the wedding reception. And Della, who is also clearly drunk, says, wait, I have one more gift for you and starts pulling off her garter because she says, traditionally, the person who catches this is the next one, two. And Bond goes, no. I'm not interested. And he tries to leave and she throws it at him and he catches it and he gets in his car. And Felix comments to her, you know, like he was married once before, you know, long time ago, which is just like, holy crap. Yeah. Another very direct reference. I remember somebody in one of our comments mentioned that this movie is about as close as we get as like a direct sequel to uh, OHMSS. I don't know that that is true, but it is very much like this is as direct a reference to the events of OHMSS as you're going to get in a Bond film. Mm -hmm. I realize I failed to mention that Della is played by Priscilla Barnes, who, as well as a bunch of different roles through the years up until most recently, 2020, was in 70 episodes of Three's Company as terry alden <laughs> well she's great in this i like della a lot yeah she's not in it for long no but the part of the movie that she's in she's a delight as soon as bond leaves felix and della go inside and are immediately met by men with guns how did they get in there i don't know exactly but boy were they quick yeah felix says leave her it's me you want and they knock felix out with the butt of their gun and hold della at gunpoint and the scene cuts away Knocked out with the butt of their gun, specifically by a very young Benicio Del Toro. Yeah. Who looks like he just walked off the set of West Side Story. <laughs> yeah. He's he's also great in this. Yeah. Sufficiently menacing. Oh, yeah. But like smart and calculating. Very, very good. He's, he's just the right amount of sadistic. He had had some TV roles prior to this, but his only movie before this one was Big Top Pee Wee, where he played Duke, the dog-faced boy. Gotta start somewhere. Yeah, no, I, I feel like this one was more in keeping with his career trajectory. Yeah. The point is, it's Benicio Del Toro. He's great. Yeah. Cut to a warehouse now, and we're introduced to a yet further hench person, I suppose, of Sanchez, Milton Crest played by Anthony Zerb. And man, there's just something unsettling about Milton Crest. You just, yeah, you see him and you're like, that's a bad guy. I mean, it's obvious he's a bad guy because he's working for Sanchez, but it's just like, 
don't like this guy. Yeah. He has been in so many Westerns. I am totally unsurprised by that. He was also one of the people on like the council in the Matrix sequels. Do you remember them? I mean, I remember that they exist. <laughs> he was in Star Trek Insurrection. Okay. Which I which I also remember exists. Oh, yeah. Of course he was. Yeah. yeah. All right. I recognize him from that. But yeah, you're right. He he is definitely a bad guy in this one. He's the right amount of like sleazy. Oh, God, he's so sleazy. He's like just the right amount of sleazy businessman. Mm hmm. Because, like, he's an American, a local to Miami, and he's just this, like, warehouse owner and drug smuggler. He, he runs front businesses, and he, oh, man, he's just scum. <laughs> <laughs> he really is. It's just something about his hair and how he carries himself. It, he feels like a used car salesman. Oh, yeah. And now all the used car sales people in our comments are going to be angry at me. But he's just not the kind of guy that I feel like you would want to be friends with. He's the kind of guy that feels like he's trying to sell you something all the time. Yeah. And Killifer is also there and they give him his briefcase of $2 million and they're going to help him escape, basically. Del Toro's character, Dario, tells Sanchez that Felix is here. And so they go down into the main area of the warehouse where Crest keeps a bunch of exotic fish and a submarine, which is how they got them out of the truck. So Felix, God, poor Felix. So Felix is there. They string him up on these ropes. He asks where Della is. And Dario says, oh God, I feel gross even saying the line. He says, oh, don't worry. We gave her a good honeymoon. And he says it just the creepiest way. Oh, it's, oh God, it's so, oh. This incenses Felix, obviously. It is never confirmed, but it is implied that they raped her. Yes, she mercifully appears fully clothed when she is found later. Yeah, so in my head canon, they only killed her. And are just taunting Felix. Yeah. Sanchez is obviously very upset with Felix and chooses to enact his revenge through the power of sharks. We're in for a happy sharks with laser beams on their head kind of situation, right? Uh... So it's kind of it's kind of an amazing device, actually. They have a pulley system and they have Felix on one end and then they tie half a cow to the other and they drop it in the water with the sharks so that when the sharks have eaten enough of the cow carcass to make it light enough, then sort of like a seesaw, then Felix will lower in to the water. It's, boy, is it ever evil. Oh, yeah. The sharks take off Felix's leg. They do indeed. And it is gruesome. This scene is super grim. This is, again, grim. But there is a really good exchange between Felix and Sanchez here where Felix is certain he's going to die, right? So as his legs are dipping into the water just before they meet Shark, he screams furiously up from this hatch at Sanchez. I'll see you in hell! Sanchez then laughs and says, oh no, today is the first day of the rest of your life. Because he is not intending to kill Felix. Yeah. He wants Felix to be alive and suffer. I like that Dario thinks this whole thing is hilarious. Sanchez doesn't seem to have a lot of expression on his face. Crest is like, oh, I don't, oh God, he's got a whole leg gone. And Killifer looks like he's about to throw up and excuses himself. <laughs> yeah. The stomach that each of them has for it is well and truly on display in that scene. Yeah. Then we cut to Bond arriving at the airport and there's police and sirens going and just seems to be a lot of law enforcement activity happening. This is the next morning. That's right. The next morning and Bond's got his luggage. He's headed back to London. So he walks up to the ticket counter at the airport, hands over his documents to the ticket counter agent. Who is, by the way, played by Teresa Blake, who was in 272 episodes of All My Children <laughs> as Gloria Marsh. Wow. Yeah. Soap operas, man. She starts to process his documents and, and issue him a ticket. And he, he just asks, what's all the excitement about? And she comments, oh, some big drug dealer escaped. <laughs> oh, no. Bond immediately realizes this is a huge problem, grabs his documents, turns and runs out the door, leaving his ticket behind. So she's just like, sir, your ticket. We then cut to Bond arriving at Felix's house. He goes up to the front door, which is closed, and knocks on it, and the door swings open. He, he walks in and discovers Della on the bed, dead, clearly, like, shot or stabbed in the chest. So he runs in and checks her, but she's gone. That makes him very angry. 
and he proceeds to walk into Felix's home office, and the whole office has been turned over. They've been searching for something. There's blood smeared on the carpet and just stuff everywhere. He looks around, and then he notices there's a body bag or, like, a canvas tarp wrapped around a body on the couch on the other side of the office. And so he steals himself for the worst and goes over and pulls the tarp aside and finds Felix evidently dead. And there's a note on his chest, and the note reads, he disagreed with something that ate him. Which is a very whimsical note. It is! Bond does not take it with whimsy. (laughs) Well, no, I mean... Bond is very upset. It'd be hard to find a sense of humor in that moment. And so he crumples up the note, but in doing so, Felix shifts, and Bond realizes he's still alive. Felix is not really conscious, but he's sort of murmuring and, and still alive. Then the phone rings, and it's Sharky saying, Hey man, how's it going? And Bond just immediately is like, Send an ambulance right now. And we cut to a little while later as Felix is being taken away in the ambulance and there are police and everything there. So the local cops are there. They're investigating the crime scene and the like homicide detective tells Bond, it's like, you stick around. I'm going to have some questions for you. Jesus Christ. (laughs) As Sharky arrives. At the hospital, Felix is unconscious in bed. Bond and Sharky are discussing the prognosis that the leg is gone, but they might be able to save his arm. Also, the homicide detective said that, oh, it's definitely a chainsaw wound. Sharky is like, I know a shark bite when I see one. That is a shark bite. (laughs) Right, because the guy named Sharky, who runs a boat charter in Florida, knows a thing or two about shark bites. Hawkins arrives at the hospital room. Basically, there's nothing they can do. The DEA can't do anything. The CIA is not going to do anything. He's not in the country. So womp womp, I guess. Uh, Bond also does not take this very well. (laughs) (laughs) And so he decides to investigate, going only on the fact that Sharky knows it's a shark bite. They start investigating exotic fish places, trying to find a place that has sharks. So he gets Sharky to drive him to apparently every place in town, because when they pull up in our next scene at what's it called? Ocean Craft? Ocean Crest. It's a pun on Milton Crest's name. It's very good branding, honestly. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Sharky comments to Bond that it's like, well, this is the last place in town. Apparently they didn't go in alphabetical order. So Bond gets out of the car and goes up to the door and knocks on the door and a security guard comes and says, we're closed. And he's like, well, please, I've come all the way from London for a meeting. And Crest is there and he's like, it's all right, let him in. He says he's from Universal Exports and he's looking for, you know, some exotic fish. And prior to that, Crest was like bundling Killifer into the back office (laughs) and telling him to hide. They chat and they look around and he's like, so, you know, any sharks? And Crest is like, oh, no, 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 don't don't do any sharks anymore. It's just all these things that you see here. And there's this great shot where they're chatting and it's a shot of Crest over Bond's shoulder. But you can see Bond looking around the room and then you see him notice something off shot his expression changes and he just immediately goes into like, oh, well, that's been fun. Thanks for your time. Goodbye. And then the camera reverses. And after Bond exits shot, the camera pans down to see what Bond saw, which is in the pile of just sort of general detritus that have been swept up off the warehouse floor is one of the carnations from the wedding. So he knows that Felix was there. There's some very good camera work in this movie. Like the quasi pov handheld work when bond is arriving back at felix and della's place and looking around the house is really really good that shot i really like there's some really excellent camera work in this movie the cinematographer was alec mills who has shot several of these movies but i just wanted to particularly call it out so then we cut to the same warehouse but at night as sharky and bond pull up in a little zodiac underneath the building as they arrive a submersible dispatches from the building Mm -hmm. it's not clear who's in the submersible is it dario at this point i have to assume sanchez has already escaped and this is just more of his men but yes it's not Killifer, but other people of import. Right, because it was established prior to this and then again in this scene that Killifer is meant to be on the next submersible after this one. Yeah. Anyhow, they, they just stay out of sight of this submersible, but they obviously note that it's there. 
once it's gone, Bond hops out of the Zodiac onto a little gangway underneath the building. And he grabs like a hook, like a... A, a boat hook. A, a boat hook. Yeah. He grabs a boat hook and starts to walk the gangway towards a ladder up into the warehouse from below. And as he's walking along, a great white shark attacks him. <laughs> from under the gangway knocking the floor up and causing him to sort of leap into the corner out of the way confirming that they have a shark tank here so that spooks him something fierce as the shark recedes back into the water pond resumes his breaking and entering into the warehouse now earlier crest had said something about the work that they do at this warehouse involving maggots to recycle it's something involving maggots. So Bond finds this enormous man-sized like refrigeration unit, I guess, that's just full of maggots or some kind of aquatic maggot. They don't look totally convincing. Yeah. But this the whole thing is sort of pulsating a little bit and he just sort of goes, all right, and rolls his sleeves up and rams his hand into the pile of maggots. And indeed, it's full of drugs. Yep. The security guard catches him, holds a gun to his head. Bond is able to fight him off by hurling maggots into his face and then chucks him into the drawer and closes it. So the man is now trapped in there with all the maggots. And then there's a bit of a gunfight. Yeah. Which Sharky hears, but can't do anything about because he's afraid to go over where all the sharks are. <laughs> So we have the gunfight. Bond manages to find like another hook thing that he uses to incapacitate the second guard. By pulling him into a tank of electric eels. Again, the shifts from grim to goofy in this movie are abrupt. <laughs> they are more apparent by the contrast. Just like this is a serious scene. And then there's this big tank that's like warning electric eels and he pulls the guy inside and then there's these like flashing lights and the electric eels are electrocuting him which is of course not how that works and he's going oh, 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 oh. and it is like it, you have to imagine that if john glenn could have had a shot of like you know the the bones through the skin <laughs> and he, they definitely yeah it definitely would have been there yeah, exactly and it's just sort of like wow that is a really jarring change yeah but eventually bond finds himself at gunpoint from killifer bond notes that killifer is stepping on the trapdoor that bond entered in through and killifer threatens to throw bond into the different other trapdoor where the sharks live just as sharky comes in the trapdoor killifer is standing on throws him off balance and bond manages to like punch him in a way that causes him to fall over the shark trapdoor but he manages to grab a rope so he's holding himself. He's managed to get just the tips of his feet on the edge of the trapdoor, and he's holding himself by this rope. At this point, he starts bargaining for his life. He tells Bond, there's $2 million in that suitcase by your feet. If you save my life, I'll split it with you. Bond walks over to the suitcase and picks it up, and he walks back over to Killifer and says, you earned it. You keep it, old buddy. Throws the suitcase full of money at Killifer. Killifer goes to grab the suitcase because it's got two million dollars in it, letting go of the rope that he was holding himself up by and falls into the shark tank as the suitcase busts open and it rains money down into the shark tank. And Killifer is eaten by a shark. Not partially. He is completely eaten and killed by the shark. Sharky comments, Oh, what a waste. And Bond looks at him and he goes, of money. <laughs> the next day out at the docks, Bond goes to Sharky's fishing charter. Oh, I just noticed because I have the movie up that almost unnoticeable in the foreground, Bond and Sharky are being watched. Oh, really? By Hawkins. It's such a wide frame in this shot that you don't notice that Hawkins walks straight through shot and parks himself right at the left of frame. Because later this will come up. But yeah, it's, I have never noticed that until literally this moment. Yeah, because it's not commented on in scene at all. No. This movie's very good, but Jesus, it's grim. <laughs> Bond chats with Sharky, who has looked into the wave crest, which is the boat that the submarine is registered to. And he says it's a big marine research vessel. It's about a six hour boat trip from here. And Bond goes, great, I'll meet you back here later. So they're going to go out to track down the wave crest because that's their best lead at this point. Mm -hmm. Bond is walking through town and Hawkins actually approaches him and is like, hey, I get it. I understand what you're doing, but you really need to leave this be. And Bond's like, I think you need to leave me alone and just let me do my own thing. And Hawkins is like, okay, that's obviously not going to happen. And then he gets approached by... <laughs> 
<laughs> two other dudes. And he's like, you need to go in here. It's clear that this guy is not just with the DEA. <laughs> There's, I think, I like to think that this is a little sort of fake out because he indicates that Bond go into this house and we get this reverse shot of someone in a suit watching Bond from the balcony with a cat. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it turns out there's just cats everywhere. If they're at Hemingway House. Yes, which gets referenced amusingly in the next scene or later in this scene, because it turns out that it's actually M. So I guess Hawkins is working for MI6, kind of. I don't know. Anyway, yeah. Yeah, it, it's not clear. At the very least, he's pulling jurisdiction, right? He's like, listen, we've got laws in this country. You are not cleared to be operating here. And I've got somebody who wants to meet with you. <laughs> so come with me. And yeah, it's M. And M is none too pleased. <laughs> the original name they wanted to go with for this movie was License Revoked. Which is definitely not as good a name. No. But it's certainly more appropriate. Yeah, but they thought that the American audience would associate it with getting like your driver's license revoked. Right. And so it was just sort of like kind of a dull thud of a name. So they went with License to Kill, which is definitely a lot more of a flashy name. Yeah, it's certainly more exciting. M is like, look, you were supposed to be on assignment. What the hell's going on? You were supposed to be on a flight to Istanbul yesterday. What's wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Bond objects, obviously. M takes him off active duty and revokes his license to kill and asks him to turn in his gun, which this is the Hemingway joke because Bond says, I guess this is a farewell to arms. And then he kicks M. <laughs> like he fully, is it a roundhouse? I can't, there's M and two guys there and a dude with a gun like up on a tower and he just attacks them, jumps off the balcony and takes off. Yep. So Bond is on his own. That's wild. Yeah. It seems like that would be a tough thing to come back from. Yeah. We have enough relationship building here between M and Bond that we have a sense that he is willing to give Bond a very, very long leash. Like he didn't hurt anybody. Mm -hmm. So I guess he's just doing his own thing. It ends up being very much to Bond's benefit that he is a quote disgraced agent later in the movie it's actually really important yes that he ends up not being part of mi6 but that also gives mi6 plausible deniability yeah if it hadn't been six years between this and the next movie which originally had a different plot than goldeneye ended up being i wonder if they would have dealt with that because it was again we'll get into this more when we talk about goldeneye but Dalton was contracted right through 1994 and should have been in one or maybe two more Bond films. And I'm curious how they would have dealt with it. Right. There's so many entertaining alternate universes that we've encountered while discussing this. <laughs> yeah, there really are. That night on the wave crest, Milton Crest is skeezing around the boat because Sanchez's girlfriend Lupe is there and he's sort of spying on her as she's in her bedroom because he's a real creep and he lets himself into her room and he's like hey you know how's it going uh you know what what you got going on and she's like just leave you need to get out of my room because you're drunk because he, he is drunk also he gets called up to the bridge and they say oh we've found something on the radar and they pull it up on video and he's like it's just a giant manta ray we have those here and then we cut to a shot of it it's clearly a giant manta ray with little man feet <laughs> little flippers <laughs> poking out the bottom and it's like how they would have been fooled by that these are people on a boat who are supposed to be pretending to do ocean research. So either it looks exactly like a manta ray and it wasn't worth calling Crest, or it's so suspicious that it's a problem. But somehow it lives in this weird James Bond negazone where he gets away with it. <laughs> it's a neat idea, though. Like, it's a cute trick. Yeah. And there's the boat, and then they also have a little remote-controlled submersible with a camera. I think it's called the Sentinel mm -hmm. that lets them keep an eye on stuff. Yes. It docks up under the main boat in, I don't know the name for this thing, but it's like there's a room in the bottom of the boat that just has like an opening that's open to the water, but air pressure and like the same way a diving bell works. Mm -hmm. The ocean doesn't just come right into it. Right. Bond uses that as his way into the boat. He also drowns a guy. A poor guy. This, this is a game. Like, what was the security guard at Ocean Crest in on it? He ended up well, depending on which security guard, one of them ended up in a vat of maggots and one of them ended up electrocuted by eels. Were they drug smugglers? Did they know? What about the ocean researchers on the wave crest? Did they know? <laughs> Judging by what happens the next day, they all definitely know. 
So Bond hides the guy in the pressure tank, the like that you use to depressure it. Like if someone has the bends. Hyperbaric chamber, I think. Thank you. Actually called. Ah, uh, yes. A hyperbolic chamber. <laughs> the hyperbolic time chamber. And he notices also in there are some giant bricks of money, like just cubes of cash. Those will become important. Very soon, yeah. So Bond starts sneaking around the boat as the body is discovered because he doesn't actually drown the guy. He just knocks him out. And Bond sneaks into Milton Crest's cabin, which is the cabin where Lupe is. And he questions her at knife point. Because he actually seemed to give any kind of a crap about her earlier when Sanchez and all of his goons abandoned her in that Jeep in the airfield during the pre-title, she seems predisposed to kind of want to help him a little bit. Mm -hmm. And she gets more and more on Team Bond as the movie goes on. Right. Which, I mean, is understandable considering the situation that she's in, where it's basically be Sanchez's mistress or die. Yeah. I mean, even so, it's be Sanchez's mistress and be whipped or die. Yeah. She gives him the best advice, which is you need to leave. (laughs) (laughs) But she also lies for him because Crest comes knocking on her door and asks her if she has seen anybody sneaking around the boat. And she says that she absolutely has not. Now, it should be noted, she is being held at knife point while she does this. It's not strictly voluntary, but she does a convincing job of it and doesn't make trouble. And this is how Bond notices that she's got the welts across her back. Yeah, but I mean, after that, she immediately turns around and is like, all right, you need to leave because this thing's happening. You've got to go that way. Like, he, she immediately is helping him escape. Yeah. Outside, it's become morning and Sharky's boat arrives, pulls up beside the crest And they've caught Sharky and killed him. And then they laugh about the fact that his name is Sharky. Bond looks like he's about to pass out from rage. It's kind of amazing. (laughs) Lupe is very sorry. At this point, he does make to leave, having sort of accomplished everything he needed to accomplish on the boat at the time. He walks up onto the deck, grabs a spear gun as the Wavecrest guy who was moments ago laughing is like, ha ha, his name was Sharky, and proceeds to fire what looks like an explosive tipped spear into the guy. He was like, this one's for Sharky, and blasts him with the spear gun. The diver then falls dead in the water, and Bond leaps in after him, strips his tank off, and uses the scuba tank that he's pulled off this guy to get away. Lupe then comes out and feigns ignorance, saying, oh, what's going on? And Crest tells her, get back in your cabin. There's a intruder about. They then dispatch all these divers to chase after Bond. While this is happening, a float plane lands. A Cessna A185F Skywagon. Oh, thank you. You've still got the internet plane database open, I see. I sure do. So we have a bunch of divers in the water chasing after Bond. We have a party boat, I'm going to call it for lack of a better term, but it's basically a mobile diving platform that has guys with like SMGs on it and is dispatching divers into the water. A float plane has just landed that we don't know the purpose of yet, but when it does, Crest is like, dispatch Sentinel. And so we then have this scene where like the gist of it is Bond is going to make some real trouble for these guys. Yeah. The Sentinel goes over to the float plane, they crack it open, and they just start loading drugs into it, like packet after packet of, I guess it's cocaine. It's cocaine, yeah. Like kilogram after kilogram of cocaine, and then they close the hatch on top of Sentinel, and it turns to go back to the ship. They sent Sentinel out there full of those cubes of money. Yeah, they sent it out with money, so they've loaded the money into the plane. Pond catches up with Sentinel by grabbing onto its tether underwater, opens the hatch on the back of it, takes out his diving knife, and just starts hammering away, stabbing open all these packets of cocaine, ruining the entire shipment, turning the entire ocean around him cloudy with cocaine in the water. So they turn the little periscope on Sentinel around to look at him, realize what's happening just in time for Bond to break the camera on it. This, of course, gives away his location. So then all the divers are like dispatched and go to Sentinel. And we have a an underwater diving chase fight scene where they're shooting at him with spear guns and he's trying to get away. And he manages to kill off his pursuers and wrestle a spear gun away from one of them. And then makes for the float plane as his means of escape. To get away, he fires the spear into the pontoon of the float plane as the float plane is getting ready to take off. Uses the speed of the float plane to carry him to the surface, 
where he then barefoot water skis behind this float plane as it's getting up to speed crest on the the wave crest sees them and the the little like party boats that had the divers on them with the guys with the smgs are chasing the plane shooting at him but he manages to dodge the gunfire and like slingshot himself around such that he is able to grab onto the pontoon of the plane just as the plane takes off He's scrabbled onto the pontoon, and one of the guys, like the co-pilot, sees that Bond is, like, scrambling up the pontoon of this plane. They tilt the plane back and forth to try and knock him off, and Bond sort of, like, monkey bars his way over to the left side of the plane, so that when the guy on the right side of the plane looks out again, he's not there anymore. And he sneaks in the back door of the plane, where all these cubes of money are, as the, like, co-pilot guy is still, like, leaned out the door looking for him, and he just pulls the emergency release on the door, causing the door to detach and the guy to fall to his death out the side of the plane. Bond then uses a money cube to deflect three bullets (laughs) as the pilot reaches for his gun and starts shooting at him, then beats the guy with this cube of money, causing all the money to spill out the side of the plane before kicking the guy in the face, hurling him out the side of the plane and taking over control of the plane, writing it, and flying off with all these other cubes of money. <laughs> Crest is like, go pick up the pilot. And Bond looks very pleased with himself having made off with what is what is apparently millions and millions of dollars in the back of this float plane as Crest looks on, realizing just how screwed he is. <laughs> Absolutely dumbfounded. How did one guy do this much damage to my operation in such a short period of time? And it's important to note that nobody who survived got a good look at his face. Right. Because that is relevant. Yes. At night, Bond is now sneaking into the active crime scene of Felix Leiter's house so he can poke around. He gets into the office, finds the CD that was hidden in the picture of Della, because of course nobody found that, puts it into this colossal CD reader and starts doing some research on Felix's computer. All of the informants that he's been working with are listed as deceased, except for P. Bouvier, with whom Felix had a meeting arranged for Thursday after midnight at the Barrelhead Bar on Bimini Island, which happens to be the next scene. That's Bond pulls up to the Barrelhead in this giant speedboat, hands a rope to the dockhand, hands him like a hundred dollar bill and says... Put her in stern first. I love that, and it's very smart. This is quite the bar. (laughs) This bar. This is the most 1980s action movie bar I could imagine. (laughs) It's all burly dudes. Like, everyone in this bar is jacked. Everybody in this bar is two Timothy Daltons put together, (laughs) including the bartender. And then we've got sexy ladies in bikinis dancing to, like, late 80s rock music. And anyhow, Bond shambles up to the bar and asks the bartender, do you know anyone named Bouvier? And he points out a table on the other side of the bar and says, over there. So Bond turns around and walks over to the table and sits down at a table with a woman and says, are are you Bouvier? And she says, where's Felix? And he says, in the hospital, which is where you'll be if you're not careful. Pam Bouvier, played by Carrie Lowell, who had an extended run on TV as defense attorney Jamie Ross on Law & Order. That's where I know her from! Yes. It was bugging me. I'm like, I recognize this actress. Where do I know her from? And I am a Law & Order fiend. So that explains it. (laughs) But only vanilla Law & Order. I was going to say, because, of course, it's all part of the greater Law & Order cinematic universe. (laughs) She was also in two episodes of Trial by Jury as Judge Jamie Ross. Oh, and in one episode of Homicide Life on the Street with our friend Yafet Koto. In this scene, she's wearing a wig. And then later there's a makeover and she has much shorter hair, which is how she typically keeps her hair. And she considered herself very much sort of not a Bond girl in her own words. It was very surprising to her to actually get cast because she had, you know, the short hair and she showed up to the audition with jeans and a leather jacket and doesn't consider herself glamorous and was like, but auditioned anyway and then got the part and was like, oh my goodness. And she's great. Yeah. And very glamorous later in the movie. Yes. <laughs> I I think, save for the last five minutes, Pam Pouvier might be one of my favorite Bond women. (laughs) (laughs) So anyhow, she notes that there have been some people there 
watching her, waiting to see who turned up to meet with her. As she and Bond are sitting at the table, two goons walk over. They sidle up and sit down at the table, one of whom is Dario. Mm. And Dario has a pretty good idea who he's talking to, because he he opens with, ah, Senorita Bouvier, don't I know you? And she says no, and he's like, oh, but I do. As he's sort of, like, talking to her, he, like, puts his hand on her shoulder, and it, it kind of makes a pass at her in, like, a really creepy way. Bond interjects and is like, keep your hands off her, she's with me. And he says, nobody's talking to you. And and then she says, he's with me, like motions at Dario, who looks down and realizes that he's got a shotgun pointed at his junk. <laughs> <laughs> he's mostly unfazed by this, looks up grinning as the beers that Bond has ordered come over. The waitress is uh, in the process of dropping them. And the other goon makes a move to pull a gun and, and go at Bond. Bond smashes his head into the table and knocks him out. <laughs> As they all sort of have a tense moment looking at each other, Pam takes a shot with the gun, but just blows a hole in the middle of the table because Dario has managed to dodge out of the way. And a bar fight starts. Everybody gets in on it. Lots of things happen in this scene. (laughs) One of the notable props is a giant, like, marlin hanging on the wall, and it gets knocked down, and somebody picks it up and uses it as a sword to try and impale Bond with. Or more of a lance, I guess, <laughs> is probably more accurate. It's not really very agile a weapon. Uh, Bond uses a chair to try and defend himself and has this like really goofy reaction is like the sword goes through the chair and misses Bond's ear. And he sort of like looks at it and looks like, ooh, that was close. Anyhow, the fight happens. Bond takes a hit to the face. Pam realizes that he's in trouble and, and like knocks out the guy that hit him. They eventually make their way to the wall where Pam blows a hole in it and they run out to the boat. Her shotgun cuts a perfect circle in the wall. (laughs) It's so ridiculous. It's very goofy. As Bond is leaping out the wall, she turns with the shotgun to the bar and that causes everybody in the bar to freeze. Then she sort of like backs out the hole. And as she turns to jump onto the boat, Dario jumps to the hole and shoots his gun out the hole in the back of the bar and hits her in the back. And she falls into the boat, having been shot. Bond at this point is like, well, screw it. We got to go. Slams the boat into high gear to the extent that boats have high gears and takes off. The goons at the bar are shooting at them in the distance. And as they get some distance behind them, Bond turns around and hears Pam groan. She's starting to move and he's like, don't move. And she's like, "Eh, it's a bulletproof vest. This Kevlar is amazing as she pulls an armor plate like out of her shirt. That's like the only line in the movie that I was like, oh, could could we take that one again? (laughs) (laughs) or just not have it because she's like it's a bulletproof vest and it's like okay that answers all the questions and then she volunteers this kevlar is amazing (laughs) it's it's like (laughs) okay bond knows what a bulletproof vest is (laughs) bond lays into her for not being very professional and we get her character biography here as she gets all pissy about it and is like listen i am an army pilot i have been to the worst hell holes in south america and i will not have you lecturing me <laughs> about professionalism hell yeah bond looks like he wants to respond but is interrupted as the control panel of the boat starts to blare alarms and the engine starts to sputter and the boat comes to a stop Pam comments, out of gas. (laughs) Bond is just like, they must have hit the fuel line. (laughs) So he at this point is like, listen, I need your help. We need to go to Isthmus City. I need to get Sanchez, basically. And you're the only person left who can help me. She agrees. And then they go into the bed compartment of the boat. After doing some kisses as well, like they're clearly up on the adrenaline of, whoa, we almost just died. And we're like kind of similar profession people. Uh, Let's sex. (laughs) What else are we going to do? We're stranded in the middle of the bay in a boat with no gas. Yeah. Then we cut to a James Bond movie. Didn't we just cut from a James Bond movie? <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. So what I was saying at the very beginning was it wasn't until the James Bond theme song hits while he is climbing onto the ascending seaplane that I was like, ah, here it is. Right. 
because the 45 minutes leading up to that were a very good 1980s action movie set in Florida involving a drug lord that didn't feel James Bond. Right. And then that moment I was like, oh, okay, okay, all right, here we go, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So no, I was being facetious. We cut to London. (laughs) And how do you know it's London, Graham? (laughs) Uh, Because there's a shot of Nelson's column and two double-decker buses. (laughs) (laughs) They didn't want to undersell it. No, we have mercifully avoided having the opening bars of Rule Britannia playing in the background. M comes out of his office and talks to Moneypenny. It kind of berates Moneypenny, actually. Because she has spelling errors in her copy, which is very unlike her. Yeah. And she's distracted by what she's looking at. She's trying to determine the whereabouts of Bond. And he sort of is like, well, what's what's this? And she's like, I thought that you might want to know if he's safe. Not for me. (laughs) And basically tells her that James is a big boy and to not do that, to not get involved or try to help him, which she immediately does. Yeah. Because she gets on the phone and calls down to Q Branch. Cutting back to a plane landing in Isthmus City as Bond and Bouvier arrive at a hotel. They have a very nice multi-roomed suite. You know, Bond is now playing the role of the high roller. He's got literal suitcases full of money opens one up in full view of the hotel manager and bellhop, tips them both graciously, asks the manager, you know, fresh flowers every day, giving him like three or four hundred American dollars in cash. He introduces Pam as his executive secretary, which gives credence to why they have like multiple rooms, but also sort of continues to put forward the illusion that he's a big important person. He orders a case of Bollinger champagne. I mean, why screw around? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's all he needed her for was to help get into the country, which she agreed to do for $75,000 after on the boat they were doing some bartering. It was like he said 50 and she said 100 and then they went back and forth repeatedly as their lips got closer and closer together until they determined it's 75. So he flips open the suitcase, which she now sees is full of money, and he gives her her $75,000. And she's like, well, well, uh, what 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 if I stay longer? What if I help out more? To which he says, all right, fine, but here, take this additional wad of cash and go and get some nice clothes. If you're going to be my executive assistant, you have to look the part. Yeah. She's a little offended by the notion that her clothes are not already nice, but (laughs) Bond heads to a bank because he asks her, what's the big bank here? And she's like, oh, there's only the one bank. Also, Sanchez runs the bank. And he's like, oh, that's perfect. Yeah. He also runs the casino. The bank and casino are like related just because it's easier, right? It's not a conflict of interest. It's just easier. (laughs) And in fact, that'll come up. So he goes to the bank and he walks in with these suitcases full of money, greets the manager of the bank and is like, I'd like to open an account. The manager is like, well, surely one of our tellers at the front can help you with that. And then one of the like bank staff walks in with the suitcases full of money and like hefts them onto the floor. And the bank manager is like, oh, right this way, sir. <laughs> <laughs> but then we sort of like cut ahead to where they finished counting all the money. And it's like, all right, 4.5 million American dollars. We are very familiar with accounts of this size and this style, sir. Will you be needing anything else? And he's like, well, could you extend me a line of credit at the casino? Let's say $2 million. And the bank manager is like, of course, we, you know, we have a direct line to the casino. And of course, your collateral is very good. It's so obviously corrupt. (laughs) In the lobby of the bank, Sanchez is there, along with a character named Truman Lodge. That character's last name is hyphenated. It's Truman Lodge. (laughs) And they are showing around. Well, we, we find out that they are Chinese investors, potential Chinese investors to crime, crime investors. Generally speaking, I try to keep things straight when I'm lured by watching the deleted scenes. And almost universally, it's like, yeah, uh, that's good that you cut that. But there's this one very brief scene of Bond and Bouvier landing in Isthmus City at the airport where she points out to him Sanchez's cronies. And she's like, that's Truman Lodge. He does the money stuff. That's Heller. He's a big, scary guy. And later they refer to these characters as if they already know who they are, as if we should already know who they are. And we don't because we didn't get that establishing scene. And I wish they'd left it in. Mm, Yeah, because later in the movie, Bond refers to Truman Lodge. And the only reason I knew who that was is because I was on IMDb at the time, because that's how I watch these movies now. (laughs) (laughs) 
it was driving me mad because Truman Lodge is played by Anthony Stark, spelled differently with a E at the end. I'm trying to figure out where I'd seen this guy before. And I think it's just that he looks a lot like other actors. <laughs> He's this snivelly business guy who definitely looks like other snivelly business guys from movies of this era. Yeah, he's definitely playing a character. And even if you don't know the actor, you know the character. Mm -hmm. So they wander around the bank and Truman Lodge is like, look at this amazing bank that we have. Back in the manager's office, Ms. Kennedy arrives, which of course is Pam Bouvier now having gotten a haircut and a amazing outfit. And Bond literally does a double take. It's great. He looks over and is like, oh, okay, some Ms. Kennedy, whatever. And then like fully turns around and his eyes go wide yeah <laughs> it's a great look on dalton like dalton plays it really well but it again sort of feels like it belongs in a different bond movie it does a bit yeah it's a great look on her as well absolutely and she plays this part fabulously she she is set to prove that she can play the role of executive assistant and so she walks in and she just basically takes control of the room yeah it's awesome there's a scene now with Sanchez, who has an iguana with a diamond necklace. I love it. And he and Truman Lodge are watching TV, and they're watching an evangelical broadcast. This is, was meant to be sort of a rip on TV evangelicals who were always asking for money. That hasn't changed. In fact, I think they've been more successful now. They just really hone in on their niche. But yeah, this is Professor Joe Butcher. It's a very cult-like looking thing. It is. I'm not sure if the religion is meant to be Christianity, but the place that they're broadcasting from doesn't look particularly Christian. There's no Christian iconography. Yeah, it, it definitely reads as cult. Yeah, big cult energy. Dr. Joe Butcher in this movie is fabulous. <laughs> oh, it's great. He's so perfectly skeezy. <laughs> <laughs> well, he is, of course, played by Mr. Entertainment, Mr. Las Vegas, the Midnight Idol, Wayne Newton, who sent a letter to Eon Films being like, I would love to have a cameo in a Bond movie someday. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, this is he's a Las Vegas crooner. It's basically all he's ever done is be an entertainer at Las Vegas. Right. Mm -hmm. And he's so perfect in this role. So why are they watching this as he begs for money from television with banks of people on phones at desks behind him? The conceit here is this is how Sanchez conducts his business. There are actually some number of people who have bought into this church, but that's not why this broadcast is happening. This is how he secretly communicates with people who want to buy his cocaine. Mm -hmm. Because Professor Joe is like, you know, we always change how much we're asking for, you know, depending on the stars or whatever. And today we want to raise $22,000. Like someone writes it on a big board and shows it to him. And it's like, we want to raise $22,000. From each of our chapters. Because that's the price for the cocaine. And then someone will call in and then he will say, oh, I've just heard that we've had this many new recruits or something from the New York chapter. And then back in the office, Truman Lodge is like, oh, the people in New York, they bought that many units of our cocaine, even at $22,000 each. This is great. So this is how they're doing this communication back and forth. It's really clever. Yeah, the mechanics of it are like totally legible in scene too. Oh, yeah. Which which would be so easy to screw up. <laughs> yeah. It, I mean, it's one of those things that you don't even really need to write it well enough that the mechanics actually work, right? Mm -hmm. But they've at least gone deep enough that at surface level, what they're doing all tracks, <laughs> which I appreciate, so that you can sort of follow along with what's happening and not just have to listen to the characters tell you what's happening. Because they don't fully explain it. It's just from everything that they're saying. You're like, oh, I get what's going on here. Okay, cool. Yeah. Down in the casino, Bond and Miss Kennedy arrive and Bond looks around, immediately asks for a private table, gets shown to a private table and immediately asks to raise the limits because he's trying to get noticed. He's being really extra. Right. And the way that he does it is amazing. He, he sits down at the private table, asks to raise the limits, bets on every hand on the table and loses. <laughs> He's playing blackjack and he loses every hand at the table. 
and then is like, I, I'd like to raise the limits further. And so then they send up a messenger to Sanchez to be like, we got this guy who fancies himself a high roller sitting at a private blackjack table playing like a schmutz. <laughs> He's just lost a quarter million dollars. Yeah, but he wants to raise the limits. Should we let him? And Sanchez is like, yeah, absolutely. And so they do. <laughs> And so the next hand comes along. Bond bets on every hand at the table. The dealer deals it out. Bond is like, all right, we're going to double down on this one. We're going to split this one. All right, cool. <laughs> the dealer does his thing and Bond proceeds to win every single hand at the table. <laughs> Just crushes it. <laughs> and so then another urgent message goes up to Sanchez. It's like, so, you know, that guy at the private table? Yeah, he's up by half a million dollars. Should we let him keep going? <laughs> And so Sanchez goes over to the camera and like looks down at Bond and is like, nah, you know what? Let him let him be. <laughs> change the dealer. Yeah. So they change the dealer and the dealer is now Lupe, one of the few people who knows who Bond is. Bond asks of her, oh, what are you doing? You know, you look well practiced. What are you doing here? And she's like, well, I used to be a dealer here. And then Bond says, so am I going to lose? And she says, yeah, but only a little. And that's when Bond is like, well, then I'd best cut my losses, right? And at this point, he has sent Pam off to get drinks from the bar, right? She's like, could you go get some drinks from the bar? I'll take a vodka martini shaken, not stirred. And so she's over at the bar, like motioning, like vodka martini shaken, not stirred, making hand motions as Bond is talking to Lupe and he like grabs her and they leave their chips behind to be cashed out. And he takes her off the floor of the casino and walks right by Pam, who's now holding two martinis, <laughs> sees them walk by, rolls her eyes, downs one of them, and then gives this look like she's just swallowed poison. <laughs> <laughs> so he gets frisked and then gets led into meet sanchez before we get into sanchez there's one other thing that's been going on around the casino over the course of the evening and that is that there has been an asian couple just noticing they're not doing anything they're just present and when bond is talking to lupe they're sort of like looking over his shoulder interestedly and when pam downs the drink and turns to walk away they are standing behind her and that's all we know about them. The, the man was one of the investors that was being shown around earlier. But throughout this scene, they're just in the background noticing what's going on. There is a little more payoff for them constantly following him around in one of the deleted scenes. But it doesn't need to be there. It's just it's enough that they're following him. And it's weird. Yeah. I mean, it'll pay off later. Yeah. Yeah. In Sanchez's office, he says, I'll be with you in a sec. Go have a seat over there. He wanders over to the window, notices that Sanchez's window has a brand, which is Armor Light 3. So it's bulletproof glass. <laughs> and Bond also notices that there's a building under construction across the street. So then Sanchez comes and has a seat and they have a chat. Sanchez looks at his passport. Like Sanchez has him mostly figured out. And I say mostly because he doesn't know that he's former MI6. He doesn't know he's a British secret agent. He doesn't know that he's actually there trying to stop Sanchez. But he's like, you are up to some kind of illegal stuff. And that's why you have all this money. Right. It's important to note that at this point, Sanchez doesn't know that he's missing a ton of money. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he hasn't learned that yet. <laughs> because that money was all supposed to go in the seaplane and Crest hasn't told him yet. <laughs> yeah. You know, because he might be able to put that together. Maybe. Maybe. Ah, Bond's covered his tracks well enough, I think. So Bond basically makes it seem that he is a hitman with enough sort of subtle references to it. He's like, yeah, you know, I'm a professional. I make problems go away or however he words it. So you're a problem solver or like a problem eliminator. That's it. It's less subtle than I thought. And <laughs> he's trying to ingratiate himself to Sanchez. He's like, I could be very useful to someone like you. And I know that you value loyalty. Hey, let me work for you. I'll be loyal. Sanchez says he will think about it. He says, you know what? I'm going to hold on to your passport until you're ready to leave town. And let me think about that. And that's basically it. He's like, oh, we'll be back in touch. And so Bond leaves and goes back to his hotel room. He meets back up with Pam. The hotel manager is there and he's like, oh, Mr. Bond, your uncle has arrived. I sent him to your suite. <laughs> they go up to the suite and they get into the elevator and Bond says to Pam, give me a gun. And she's got a little handbag and she's wearing like a, a ball gown, basically, or like a, a sequin dress. And so she has this tearaway section 
sort of at the knee line of her dress. And so she tears away this section of the dress and pulls a gun out of a thigh holster and hands it to Bond, this tiny little gun, which Bond then very seriously racks the slide on, looking like he means business. And he goes to the room and he tells Pam to wait in the sort of the elevator lobby, just in case there's a problem. So she goes over and stands by the wall and reaches into her handbag and pulls out another tiny gun and just stands there in the hall, brandishing a gun, waiting to see what happens. Bond goes to his room and sort of like begins to sneak in the door, discovers there's, of course, there's a man in the room, busts through the door, knocks the man sort of ass over tea kettle into a chair, only to realize that the man is Q. And he's like, Q, I could have killed you. And Q is like, listen, I figured you could use some help. And I've brought you a case of like all the things a traveling gentleman needs. Specifically, Money Penny told Q where Bond was and got Q to come and help. Right. So Q is here with help and begins to run him through all the things in the case that are important, like a toothpaste tube full of plastic explosive and an alarm clock. The alarm clock is great just because of the line that he delivers. It's an explosive alarm clock guaranteed never to wake up anyone who uses it. <laughs> also, the brand of toothpaste <laughs> is Dentonite. <laughs> And if you look into the case, there's some weird stuff in here. There's like a rat trap. There's a Polaroid camera, which will come up in a moment. But as he's going through the stuff in the case, Pam busts in the door, gun drawn. And Bond like turns around and is like, no, 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 he's with me. It's OK. He's fine. She's like, sorry, I just, you know, I thought something had happened. <laughs> I was worried you needed backup. Bond introduces them by saying, Pam, this is Q, my uncle. Q, this is Pam, my cousin. Yeah. Cousin being a colloquialism for someone from the CIA. Right. That like MI6 calls people from the CIA their cousins. So Q says, oh, we must be related. <laughs> <laughs> so then we get the, the prime gadget, which is a camcorder that turns into a sniper rifle. It is a signature gun, so like it is actually programmed to only respond to Bond's handprint and will not fire in the hands of anyone else. That's our signature weapon here. While Q is walking Bond through this, Pam finds the Polaroid camera and puts it up and just tells Bond and Q, it's like, smile, boys, and goes to take a photo. Q is like, don't use the flash, and shoves Bond out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> as the flash emits a laser beam that shoots across the room and burns a hole through a photo of the president that's hanging on the wall. And Q is like, ah, don't mess around with things you don't understand. You could have killed someone. Oh, the Polaroid image. I forgot this when I made this joke earlier. <laughs> the Polaroid image has the friggin' like bonded Q skeletons. It almost looks like just because of the way it's like put together, it it, it looks like the the photo of the president is also been X-rayed. <laughs> <laughs> the scene ends with Pam excusing herself to bed in the master bedroom, closing the doors behind her, leaving Bond and Q to split the two beds in the other room, with Bond commenting, Well, I hope you don't snore, Q. <laughs> Later that night, Sanchez and Truman Lodge are hosting a meeting in the boardroom with all of these potential Chinese investors. I guess this might be the next night. It doesn't really make sense that to be later that same night. Bond and Pam are back at the casino, having done fairly well, it seems. Bond hands her a pile of chips and is like, okay, we're actually done now. I think he tells her to go home like three times over the course of this movie. <laughs> He's like, all right, you don't want to be here when this goes down. Here's a pile of chips. It's a bonus. Take off. Goodbye. And she looks kind of sad about that. He's wearing a tuxedo, of course, so he disguises himself as a waiter takes a tray of drinks and carries on through the casino, sneaking out the top of an elevator onto the roof and lowering himself down on a rope that was hidden in his cummerbund. I love it. It's so good. To the window outside Sanchez's room where this meeting is taking place. He is briefly startled by some doves. Thank you, director John Glenn. <laughs> I, OK, so when I was watching this the other night, that scene happened and I said, like, audibly in my apartment, he did it again. <laughs> <laughs> 
Heller comes over to the window to check it out, but there's another bird. So he's like, oh, it was just birds. And Bond sneaks around in front of the window in what would clearly be visible. But anyway, squeezing out the toothpaste of plastic explosive and leaving the detonator, which looks like a box of cigarettes, outside the window. Inside the room, Sanchez is unveiling his enormous plan of how he can smuggle cocaine anywhere in the world, and he wants all of the money. One of the potential investors, a character by the name of Quang, is the one who has been watching Bond this whole time. He says, how do we know that this is going to work? How do we trust you on this? And he says, I tell you what, I'll show you all the facility tomorrow. You can come and check it out. Truman Lodge looks annoyed because he's like, oh, I knew trade secrets. <laughs> but Sanchez is like, don't worry about it. It'll be fine. Quang, by the way, is played by Kari Hiroyuki Tagawa, who would go on to play Shang Tsung in Mortal Kombat. Ah, that's our second Mortal Kombat character. Re most recently, he's played Nobusuke Tagomi in The Man in the High Castle. He was in the Netflix remake of Lost in Space. He was in two episodes of Heroes. Remember Heroes? Remember how awesome Heroes was and then how totally not good it was after that? <laughs> I do remember Heroes. One and a like half seasons of great TV in a five season TV series. He was also one of the bailiffs for Q's Tribunal of the Human Race in Encounter at Farpoint, the pilot episode of Star Trek The Next Generation. Perfect. He has more to do in this movie, but not for much longer after that. After Bond places his plastic explosive, he goes back outside where his man, Q, <laughs> drives him away. And he drives him up to a building. It's the building that's under construction that Bond saw the previous day from Sanchez's office. Bond gets out of the car. Q hands him a package, like a, a big wrapped present, and uh, says, here you are. And Bond says, thanks, Q. You're a hell of a field agent, but it's time for you to go home. And he was like, what? And Bond is like, yep, I'm on my own from here on out. It's time for you to go. And he leaves Q behind in the car and walks over to this derelict building under construction with his package. And as he walks into the building, we cut back to the business meeting where Sanchez has brought a lot of women in and invites all of his investors to join the party with all these women. Bond gets onto the roof of this building and begins to assemble the camera that turns into a sniper rifle. And so he begins to assemble the sniper rifle. And this is intercut with Sanchez having a chat in his office saying that like this Quang character, he's a bit of a troublemaker, isn't he? We should look into him. I don't trust him, but it'll be all right. He won't expose the operation, but, you know, we should keep our eyes on him. They also are interrupted by the president of Ithma City, President Hector Lopez. We've seen posters for him all over the city. And he comes in and throws a piece of paper down on the table and says, my check is half as big as it was last month because the Sanchez runs the country. He's the president's taking payoffs from him. Sanchez basically just goes, a reminder, Mr. President, that you're only president for life. <laughs> and <laughs> President Lopez just annoyedly picks up the check and leaves. Yeah. By the way, the president is played by Pedro Armendariz Jr., so the son of Pedro Armendariz, who played Karen Bay in From Russia with Love. Oh, of course. Yeah. Oh, that's great. He himself has an extensive IMDb page longer than you can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> Most of it not English language productions, so not stuff I'm familiar with, but he's had a lot of roles over the years. While Bond is sighting up Sanchez, a light goes on elsewhere on that floor and he pans his scope over to check it out and sees Heller and then sees Pam talking to Heller, like apparently working with him. And Bond just looks astonished. Yeah, as she hands him a white envelope. He refocuses, realizes he needs to tackle the task at hand, sights up on Sanchez, blows up the bulletproof window and is about to take a shot at Sanchez when he is attacked from behind by a ninja. By an actual ninja! <laughs> There's no way around it. I, it's so silly. It's, it's a ninja. This was the point in the movie where I was very much like, man, this movie's weird. <laughs> this movie's just all over the place. Suddenly ninjas! And not only one ninja, there's two ninjas! 
<laughs> because the one ninja tries to pick up Bond's gun and use it again. Like, he, he knocks the gun out of Bond's hand and knocks Bond over and manages to grab the gun and goes to shoot Bond with the gun. But, of course, the gun won't work because it's not assigned to his handprint. So the one ninja is, like, looking at the gun, trying to figure out why it won't shoot, when another ninja jumps out of the rafters and throws a net at Bond. And they manage to get him in the net and they club him on the head with the butt of the gun and drag him away. We cut then to Bond bound and gagged and tied to a table being woken up by these two ninjas, one of whom was the woman in the couple that's been following Bond around. And Quang is also there. Quang puts the handle of the gun in Bond's hand and it activates and he's like, okay, this is some serious tech. What's going on? You are working with the British government. What the hell are you doing here in Isthmus City? You are not supposed to be here because Quang is working for Hong Kong secret intelligence Mm -hmm. and is furious with Bond because they've been trying to bring Sanchez down and tomorrow they're going to get a chance to finally see Sanchez's operations and Bond may have just jeopardized that. There was another car that was shown to be following Bond earlier and in fact followed them here to this place. In the other car is Fallon, played by Christopher Neem, who's been in, gosh, actually lots of stuff. Oh, he's been in several Star Treks. (laughs) He looks like someone who would be in Star Trek. He does, doesn't he? Yeah. Anyway, he is, for the purpose of this movie, he is the actual MI6 agent in Isthmus City who's been tipped off and told to bring Bond in. So he has a vial of, like, knockout juice. (laughs) He's planning to sedate Bond and ship him back to the UK. Fallon is a little apologetic to Quang, but mostly just sort of like, look, this guy doesn't work for us anymore. Thanks for your help. (laughs) Sorry about your luck, I suppose. Outside the building is now a tank. And like an entire platoon of soldiers. Yeah. They open fire on the building. Fallon goes to inject Bond with the drug, and it's actually not clear whether he succeeds. But Bond is unconscious, so we'll assume that he does. As the tank outside opens fire, blows up the building, the debris drops a rafter on Fallon, killing him. Another explosion kills Quang's ninja friends, and and Quang dies. Once the building is in ruins, the military moves in to secure the premises. They find Bond. Sanchez is there, of course, as he runs the whole country, so he runs the military as well. The arrangement of this scene and the arrangement of what he finds is very convenient to Bond because he walks into this building and finds an unconscious Bond with his hands and legs bound strapped to a table with a Hong Kong intelligence agent and an MI6 intelligence agent and two ninjas dead around him. (laughs) And obviously injured in a way that's not easily faked. Right. So they're like, who is this guy? And it's a very the enemy of my enemy moment, right? They're like, wow, if they wanted him and we know this guy was a hitman, he must have been onto something. Let's get this guy. And so they bring him back to Sanchez's house. It's great. I love it. And the cut the next morning is possibly... (laughs) This is possibly my favorite, like, five seconds of this film. As we cut to this lavish bed, white linens and the whole bit, and Bond is lying in it, and he comes to, and he, like, thrashes around a bit and then bolts upright, unsure of his surroundings, but, of course, remembering where he was last time he was conscious, and he lurches forward in bed, and we get this shot reverse shot of Bond's face looking terrified, and then the shot from Bond's point of view of this stupid dopey looking fish statue (laughs) with this totally dumbfounded looking face staring back the stupid human faced fish statue is possibly my favorite prop in this entire movie i adore it it's so good it's great dumb fish statue (laughs) every time i look at it it makes me laugh bond stumbles out of bed having now realized that he's not in imminent danger takes in his surroundings. The, the He's in this lavishly decorated room and uh, he, he walks over to the mirror and, and like checks out his injuries and tries to figure out what's going on. After checking himself in the mirror, he discovers that his tuxedo, which he was wearing, wearing the previous night, has been washed and pressed and hung over a chair. So he gets dressed in just the pants and the shirt and proceeds out into the remainder of this compound, basically. We get a sense of how 
extravagant this place is. There's like a waterfall and a staircase and a whole pool patio and a bar. And Sanchez is at the bar and he walks over and, and greets Bond. It's like, hello, why don't you have a seat? I'll get you a drink. Go sit with Lupe and w we can talk. But welcome to my home. The location is amazing. Oh, yeah. The location is incredible. This is La Casa Arabesque, which is an enormous villa in Acapulco that overlooks the bay. Like, it's great because, like, you can see the city across the bay. So it's like you're right there in Acapulco, but you have the entire harbor between you and the actual city. It was built and owned at the time by Baron Enrico di Portanova, known as Ricky. He was a member of the Jet Set when that was a thing. So like a socialite, he was just independently wealthy and known for flying around the world and partying. Only I could be known for flying around the world and partying. The Wikipedia entry suggests he died on February 28th, 2000 at his property in Houston, certainly from cancer at the age of 66, according to him. But all of his friends agree he was much older. <laughs> So there you go. He's thanked in the end credits. But yeah, this is an amazing location. It really is. I think the room that Bond wakes up in is a set just because of how it looks out the window. But this location where he and Lupe are sitting is amazing. Yeah. So Bond walks over to Lupe to sit down and she just immediately volunteers. The wave crest is docking tonight. Crest is coming here. Bond acknowledges what she said, but doesn't carry the conversation on any further. Sanchez comes over and dismisses Lupe and sits down to have his conversation with Bond. So in this scene, Sanchez is still feeling out Bond, right? But at this point, they have some camaraderie going. So he opens up with like, sounds like you and I both had close calls last night. And Bond thanks him for showing up when he did. He's like, well, it's a good thing you turned up when you did or things were about to get nasty. So Sanchez is like, well, who were they? And this is where Bond starts spinning a web. He knows he can use this to his advantage. So he says, well, they were a freelance hit team. One of them must have recognized me in the casino. Sanchez is like, oh, so you know these guys. And Bond says, well, I used to work for British intelligence. He explains that he's like, I know people because in British intelligence, we kept dossiers on people. This basically just wins Sanchez over. He's, he's like, ah, oh, that's awesome. Cool. I knew it. You, you've got class. You have all the makings of a former intelligence officer. I do think I can use you. He's like, those men who tried to kill me, who would do such a thing. And this is where Bond starts to like really, really play people against each other. He says, someone close to you. He essentially insinuates that Crest is trying to kill him. <laughs> <laughs> he basically leads Sanchez there. Yeah. He lets Sanchez make that leap, but he's like someone inside your organization who would stand to gain from it, who knows the comings and goings, you know, that sort of thing. He says they expect they being the MI6 agent and the people from Hong Kong intelligence who he is claiming are a hit team. He says they expected to be paid today by someone arriving with a bunch of money. <laughs> <laughs> which is <laughs> god that's fast thinking because lupe just told him that crest was on his way in yeah it's so good anyhow this information starts the gears turning in sanchez's head so they end the conversation and it's like all right all right i got things i need to do so i'm gonna go in the meantime stay here and enjoy my hospitality pond is like no no i have to get back to the hotel and he's like no i insist <laughs> And he calls Lupe over and is like, Lupe, show Bond the easy way back to the residences and brings them over to what are these things called? It's a funicular. That's right. That's the name of it. He puts them both on the funicular and then turns it on and it starts to ascend out of shot. <laughs> Sanchez turns to go back to where he was as one of his men who he asked to look into Bond comes up and he's like, you're not going to believe who this guy is. And Sanchez now thinking that he's got a friend is like, oh, he's former British intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> the guy is like, how did you know that? And he's like, I have my ways, he says, to try to remain mysterious. He's like, I always have to be a step ahead. Oh, it's so good. But it's particularly good because like former British intelligence is the correct answer for like an agent who has been disavowed, but he doesn't ask for any more information. The amount of information left out of this conversation because they never actually like go into detail on either side. It's quite possible that, like, henchman dude knows more, right? Because he's like, oh, well, he would have been recently disavowed and unlicensed. But what Sanchez says is correct. 
mm-hmm. <laughs> so he doesn't feel the need to like offer more information he just thinks sanchez knows everything already it's a great scene in terms of like this is how real miscommunications happen and i like it <laughs> <laughs> Bond gets Lupe to help him get back into town. He's like, I have to get back into town. I'll come back, but I have to get out of here. And so she agrees to help him. She's more and more, she is completely falling for him, if not totally by this point. So she distracts one of the guards and then takes off down to her speedboat. And the guard realizes, oh, I'm not supposed to let her leave. And she just takes off in the boat and is like, I'm just going shopping. I'll be back soon. Goodbye. And he, he's like, oh, God, Sanchez is going to kill me if he fights out. <laughs> and then as she takes off across the harbor, Bond sort of pulls himself up from the side of the boat where he's been hiding. It looks really uncomfortable. Yeah. Back in the hotel room. Pam is smoking like a chimney while Q uses funky illuminated glasses to look at whatever it is that he's working on. Bond finally comes back. He bursts through the door, grabs Pam, yells at Q to start packing up his things, hurls Pam onto the bed in the master bedroom, pulls her own gun on her and is like, what were you doing with Heller? Why are you trying to double cross me? What the hell is going on? She reminds him, I am in the CIA. (laughs) I have my own reasons for being here. Sanchez has four Stinger missiles, and I made a deal with Heller to give them up in exchange for, was it amnesty or a bunch of money? It was amnesty, you're right. The letter that she had was the letter confirming immunity if he gave them up. (laughs) And she got that letter from Felix because Felix was her contact, That was why she was in his office earlier in the movie. She tells Bond that because of his theatrics that evening, blowing up the window and trying to execute Sanchez, Heller got cold feet and called off the deal. So Bond has ruined a bunch of other people's plans (laughs) with his revenge scenario. She tells him that because he failed to execute Sanchez, Sanchez has now tripled his security and there's no way you'll get another shot at him. So all of our plans are ruined and we're never going to be able to kill him now. Bond says we don't need to get another shot at him as he hands back her gun. He comes back into the main room where Q is sadly trudging towards the door with all of his bags. And he says, Q, unpack those bags. And Q is like, yes, sir. You know, Q's really excited (laughs) to be doing stuff again. So then we cut to the bank manager's office. Yeah. As Bond walks in and the bank manager's thrilled to see Mr. Bond and his suitcases walk in the door. Because, of course, Bond had previously told the bank manager, expect another similar deposit every month. And so Bond walks in with suitcases and the bank manager's like, well, Mr. Bond, welcome. And Bond says, I'm here to make a withdrawal. And you can see his, the bank manager's face drop. Yeah. <laughs> Cut to that night, Bond, Q, and Pam are all on a pilot boat. Uh, if you're not familiar, because this comes up a lot around here where, where we live, a pilot boat is a local captain who knows the local shipping area, the things to avoid, how you're supposed to pilot a boat through a certain area, who will come aboard a ship that is passing through and drive it for the necessary section. So like where I live in Victoria, there's tons of container ships that come through the strait. And so there's a little pilot boat down by the cruise ship dock. And so they putter out, climb aboard, steer the boat through, then get back on their pilot boat and come back to land. And the wave crest is large enough that it needs that. So the pilot boat pulls up alongside them and Pam, wearing coveralls, gets on board and everyone's like, are you the pilot? She's like, yup. What's the problem? Never seen a lady pilot before? Yeah. And she's faking an accent. <laughs> This whole scene is so silly. This whole section is so silly. How did they get the pilot boat? How did they get the Harbor Master's cooperation in this? <laughs> We're back in a real, legit, actual Bond movie now. <laughs> we, we are for a bit, aren't, aren't we? I never considered where the hell they got the pilot boat. That's a great question. Yeah. Maybe they paid off the Harbor Master. Uh, They have the money. Anyhow, it doesn't matter. It's just this was the thought that crossed my mind. It's like, how did they do this? (laughs) So she starts piloting the boat in, rams it full throttle, and the wave crest runs into a piece of the dock. 
What baffles me is that she then runs away into the boat, like down into the bowels of the ship. And the crew are like talking about how the local pilot captain went bananas and crashed it. But no one tries to chase her or talk to Q, who's driving the pilot boat. No one is like, (laughs) what did your person do? They just sort of ignore him. They all treat it like it's a little weird, but like happens on the regular. This is like my only big like flashing light narrative problem with the movie is just like why don't they care (laughs) (laughs) like this is the kind of thing that you would think would set off alarm bells for everyone right yeah but then sanchez is there watching this happen (laughs) and he just chalks it up to crest is an idiot yeah and crest gets off the boat and sanchez is like what happened here crest is just like oh harbor master went crazy (laughs) really (laughs) Very odd. Pam sneaks down to the area where the sentinel thing docks and opens the hatch, allowing Bond to swim up from underneath the boat. At his signal, Q then releases a sack, which Bond also pulls up under the boat, which is full of all of the money. So they both deposit all the money into the pressure tank. Where it had been previously. We cut back to Sanchez doing one of the... It's I love scene changes like that, where it's like, you don't need to hear everything explained again. We cut back to Sanchez going, let me get this straight. Then he just flies away. <laughs> Crest has now explained everything that happened in the earlier scene where Bond completely ruined the entire drug deal. And Crest is now realizing how ridiculous it sounds, saying it out loud. (laughs) Even though everyone on his crew saw it happen. Yeah. He's just like, "Uh, yeah, I flew away with, with all the money. Sanchez is like, so I don't have any of my drugs and none of my money. He has sent two of his guys to sort of check around the boat, and some of them almost found Bond and Pam, but they don't, and they're able to sneak back out and swim and get away. But they do see the money, so one of them lets himself into the meeting and whispers in Sanchez's ear, and then they go downstairs and open the chamber, which is full of money. Of course, Crest is completely dumbfounded and is like, that's not my money. And Sanchez goes, no, it's my money. And he snaps, grabs Crest, hurls him into the chamber, and cranks the pressure up. We're back to Grimm again. <laughs> oh, this is super grisly, yeah. Apparently knowing exactly what Sanchez wanted to do, one of Sanchez's guys hands him a fire axe, which he uses to cut the pipe going into the chamber, making it instantly depressurize, which makes Crest explode. Yes, it blows up his head like a balloon. This is probably one of the goriest deaths in a Bond movie. Oh, yeah. This one's gruesome. This one had a 15 rating in the UK, which was unusual for a Bond movie. And this particular death was trimmed down to this to avoid a higher rating. Yikes. Yeah. It, they made this like prosthetic head with a cast of Anthony Zerb's face. And it was like really unpleasant, apparently. Yeah. I mean, the effect is pretty convincing as is. Yeah. But it's grotesque. <laughs> Not necessarily the way I'd like to go. If I have my choice. No, given the options. I think the thing that really sells this bit for me is we see a shot of Crest like with his hands on his ears and then it cuts away and then it cuts back to the prosthetic expanding head, but it's still his human hands on the head. Yeah. So the hands are moving <laughs> like real human hands. It sells the effect really well. It does allow for one of the quippier lines of the movie. It's one of the best lines in the movie, honestly. (laughs) Yeah. Sanchez is leaving and the guys ask him, what what should we do with all this money? Because the money was still in the tank. And Sanchez just says, launder it. (laughs) (laughs) The pilot boat somehow gets away scot-free and arrives back at the dock. And Bond now for the, I don't know, 13th, 14th time tells... Pam Bouvier and Q (laughs) okay now for real you both have to leave and there's like this shot of them both sad Hulk walking down the (laughs) the dock it really is do 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 Paul Bond takes the pilot boat back because he has to get back to Sanchez's place Bond's luggage from the hotel is sitting outside his room Sanchez asks one of his dudes like so how's that stuff and the guy says oh it's all clean it's fine he says all right well let's see what our friend is up to and opens the door and bond is there asleep in bed 
so Sanchez walks over to him. Bond does a very convincing mm -hmm, mm -hmm, <laughs> when the lights get turned <laughs> on. Sanchez chucks him a pile of cash and is like, thanks for your help. Thanks to you, I was able to get the man who was plotting against me. And Bond is like, oh, just one man. <laughs> I've been trying to figure out how to make a hot fuzz reference here with the like, oh, it's just the one killer actually, but I can't quite <laughs> parse it properly. But anyway, I think that Bond pushed it too far with this, with going, oh, just one? I would have assumed there would be more. And Sanchez goes, why is that? And Bond's like, anyone would be crazy to go against you by themselves. From Sanchez's reaction, you get the impression that he's not totally convinced now. Yeah, it's the laugh and the like the look that he gives as he turns to walk out the door. Truly, it doesn't really matter that much because the rest of the movie rolls the way it does. Yeah, and it's never honestly clear if he believes Bond here or not. Yeah, I mean, Bond just makes his move fast enough that it doesn't ever matter. Yeah. So whether or not it would have blown up in his face is sort of immaterial to what actually happens. But what happens next is that Lupe comes into the room. After Bond's gotten out of bed, still wearing his pants, he only managed to get his shirt off. <laughs> so Lupe comes into the room and Bond is like, what are you doing? You can't be here. And he like grabs a chair and puts it under the doorknob to lock the door to prevent anybody from coming in. And I don't remember what she says exactly, but they definitely start making out and then they do it. Well, she says that it's a common thing that he does where he goes off to wherever and she knows that he won't be back for hours and hours and hours. So she's not remotely worried about being discovered. But I mean, also, she has a bad track record for this. Yeah, she busts into the room and, and her reasoning for doing so is like, I was alone and I was scared, which is not a great reason. But anyhow, they do it, and we cut back to Bond's hotel room again, where Q and Pam still haven't left. <laughs> they are doggedly refusing to leave, which is good for Bond because Lupe arrives. She relays some information to them about what Bond's plan is. When Bond told Q and Pam to get out of the country and go, he was like, I have my own exfiltration plan. I will meet you in Florida but we have to go our own ways to get out of the country safely. Lupe comes in and is like, I'm scared for Bond. He's going up against Sanchez alone, and I don't think he can do it. And Pam is like, no, nah, no, nah, he's safely out of the country by now. What are you talking about? He was planning to leave when we parted ways with him last night. And Lupe is like, no, no, you don't understand. He slept with me last night, which does not sit well with Pam. <laughs> Well, she says he spent the night with me, but she also continues with, I just love him so much. And Q just rolls his eyes. <laughs> After Lupe leaves, Q also reassures her. He's like, look, sometimes a field agent, you know, just has to do things in the line of duty. <laughs> <laughs> has to use every tool at their disposal. A plus wingman Q. Great job. Yeah. <laughs> This is the one thing I don't like in Pam's character. I feel like Pam's character, as depicted up to this point, would totally get it. Yeah. The fact that she, for the last 30 minutes of this film, arcs into, like, spurned lover really sucks. I don't like it. She also does a swear. She does. She says bullshit. <laughs> there are two S words in this movie. I forgot the other one. The second one is yet to come. So Q tries to reassure her and she says bullshit and Q sort of sighs resignedly. But they do still plan to help Bond. We cut to that plan beginning to take shape. Now we're back in a Bond movie again. <laughs> yeah, big time, yeah. We see a convoy of cars driving up the hill and there's this man sweeping on the side of the road. And as the cars go by, we pan in on the guy sweeping and it's none other than Q in a totally real, not at all fake mustache <laughs> that he has sort of lopsidedly pinned under his nose. And he flips the broom around so he's got the brush up next to his head and he pulls an antenna out of it. And he uses it to communicate a message saying that Bond has just left the compound in a convoy headed to the main highway. So Pam, on the other end of this radio, receives the message and proceeds to follow them to the airport. After he finishes the radio call, Q also just yeets this incredibly <laughs> expensive spy device into the bushes. <laughs> Which apparently was Desmond Llewellyn's suggestion after all the guff that Q has given Bond over not respecting Q branch gadgets over the years. He just he's just like, well, done with this. Yo. <laughs> 
So Pam arrives at the airport where her plane is, and the plane is like torn apart <laughs> on the tarmac. And so she walks up to the mechanics and is like, what happened to my plane? What, why have you done this? And one of the mechanics hands her a sheet of paper and she's like, overhaul? And it turns out that her plane has been grounded and ordered for overhaul by Sanchez. Her plane, by the way, is a Beechcraft B-55 Baron. Thank you. No problem. What's the one in the background? The Piper PA-18150 Super Cub. Ah, very good. I ask because she's about to steal it. Uh, <laughs> so there's a crop duster plane idling behind her and she takes it because she's like, well, where can I find another plane? And the guy just shrugs. But we don't find that out right yet because we cut over to Sanchez's compound where Sanchez, Dario, and Heller all are running to a helicopter. Which is an Aerospatial AS350B Ecuru. <laughs> Very good. This is the extent of the page. This is every flighted object <laughs> listed on this page. <laughs> Then we cut back to the convoy of cars and they are arriving at this like cult facility that we have seen with Dr. Joe Butcher. And this is ostensibly where the drug manufacturing facility is. This is also our third act set piece. So in the movie, it's the Olympatek Meditation Institute. In real life, it's the Otomi Ceremonial Center in Tomoya in Mexico. And it's curious, there's a lot of not conflicting information. There's an incomplete picture about what this place actually is. It's a recent construction for indigenous people, specifically the Otomi people. They're one of the indigenous peoples of Mexico. But this particular place, construction began in 1977. So it's a very recent construction intended to be like a congregation place that apparently like wasn't used for many years and it now is a bit of a tourist attraction. The takeaway, however, is that there are also two foreground miniatures used. I bet you can guess one of them. The giant helipad that lifts out of the ground? Yeah, exactly. That's not a thing that actually exists there. <laughs> and then there's another foreground miniature of just basically a set extension with the underground tunnel access. Right. So they drive around back and go into the secret drug facility that's underneath the place. On the drive-in, Truman Lodge says that this place is actually a front, but the cult aspect ended up being successful enough because Professor Joe is really good at his job. So he makes a tidy profit on the side, actually being this preacher guy, which I kind of like that they're like, eh, turns out people are rubes. <laughs> As they're pulling around back, we see a crop duster plane sort of bank as it's flying overhead. And we get a, a close shot of Pam at the helm of the, the crop duster looking over this facility. Mm -hmm. So they go in and the account guy, Truman Lodge, tells all of the Chinese investors and Bond, who is with them, to uh, put on these filtration masks because uh, they wouldn't want any of their drug dealers to get hooked on their own supply. And they all have a good laugh about that. And they get the tour of the place. While this is happening, the helicopter that Dario and Heller and Sanchez are on arrives in the previously mentioned foreground miniature underground helipad that has a giant hatch that levers out of the ground to allow the helicopter in. It's super convincing, though. They've got all these people like milling about in front of it, and it, it looks super good. So anyhow, they arrive and Truman Lodge continues to show the facility and we get a, a look at how this actually works. They have these bricks of cocaine that drop into a, I don't know what it's called, like a shredding machine, basically. And their formulation of cocaine allows it to dissolve undetectably into gasoline. And it can be easily reconstituted from the gasoline. The gist of it is that they are going to ship each of their investors like a tanker truck full of gasoline that has cocaine dissolved in it. They will give them the secret for how to like reconstitute the cocaine out of the gasoline in the truck, and they get to keep the gasoline as a little added bonus, and they can do whatever they want with that. While this is going on, Dario and Sanchez and Heller join the tour because they, they have arrived and they see it's going on, and Dario is particularly interested because, as you recall, Dario has met Bond. Mm-hmm. And when Bond walks by, despite the fact that he's got a filtration mask on, something jogs in his mind. And so he asks Sanchez, who's the new guy? Sanchez just says, eh, somebody I thought could be useful. Then we cut to Pam arriving at the gate of this meditation center, posing as a cultist. 
and she's got a bag full of money and she runs up to the guy at the front and is like hey i want to see dr joe the guy manning the gate is like sorry we're not accepting visitors today and she's like oh but our whole chapter took up a collection they'll be so sad if joe doesn't accept the money himself and she flashes the bag of money at him and he's like oh i'm sure we can make an exception come right this way we'll find dr joe and then we cut back to the lab where Truman Lodge is showing the process of reconstituting the cocaine from the gasoline. And he says, it's OK, you can take off your masks now. You're safe in here. Bond is aware that Dario is suspicious of him. And so he doesn't want to take off his mask because he knows Dario will recognize him the moment he does. He maneuvers himself in a way that has his back to Dario before taking his mask off. But he's clearly the last person in the room to do so, mm -hmm. which only makes Dario more suspicious. Then we cut back to Pam, who's meeting Dr. Joe. And Dr. Joe is like, hello, I hear you have a gift for me. She hands him the bag and he like glimpses at it and then immediately passes it off to an underling and proceeds to like invite her to his private chambers and is mega skeezy. Oh, she's so skeezy. It's great. <laughs> He's just like... <laughs> Oh, have you ever thought of studying here? Let me show you around. It's like, <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. There's like a giant bed and he's like, this is my private meditation chamber. I had it soundproofed so that nobody can disturb me. And she's going along like she is completely wise to what is going on. But he's taking advantage of his position, I think, is what I would describe what he is doing as. Anyhow, Dario catches up with Bond. <laughs> He realizes who Bond is and recognizes him in the lab. And so he walks up behind him and puts a gun in the small of his back and is just like, stay quiet. At this point, Sanchez sort of starts to get the idea that something's up. But neither of them want to make a scene to avoid screwing things up with all these investors. Yeah, so everything is being played on the down low at the moment. Then we cut back to Pam and Dr. Cho as she's like lying on the bed and he's lying on the bed and he's trying to make something happen. And she's like, oh, I have a present for you. And he's like, oh, what's that? And she like flashes her inner thigh at him and he's like, oh, ho. And then in the motion of flashing her inner thigh, she grabs the gun out of her thigh holster and holds him at gunpoint as she grabs a like cultist robe and backs out of the room. And Joe just has this like grin on his face basically the entire time. Like, oh, I've been played. This is awesome. <laughs> I love his just bless your heart. Yeah. Which I know bless your heart is Southern for F you. <laughs> yeah. But he doesn't mean it that way, right? He's just like, wow, I've been got. So then we cut back to the lab and the demonstration is ending. Sanchez goes to demonstrate that the gasoline is still good. He drops a lit stick in the little vial of gasoline that they've just reconstituted this cocaine from. And it causes a bit of a like poof of fire and everybody sort of lurches back from it. Bond takes advantage of this moment to turn around and headbutt Dario right in the face, knocking him down. And then he grabs the flaming vial of gasoline. I don't know why Sanchez didn't see this coming. Grabs the flaming vial of gasoline and just pitches it at a table full of chemicals on the side of the room. Bond doesn't manage to get away, though. All of the investors take off running, and the fire is going, and so there's alarms going off. But Dario and another henchman manage to grab Bond, and they pull him out onto this catwalk and just start working him over with punches. And Sanchez comes out to find out what's going on, basically. And Dario is like, I know him. He's a British agent. He's working against you. Sanchez then, of course, gets quite angry and proceeds to like, like, who are you working for? What are you doing? What do you want? What are you trying to achieve? Bond's not giving him anything. So they turn on the conveyor belt into the shredding machine. Uh. <laughs> And Sanchez grabs a cord from a set of Venetian blinds. He just rips the cord off and they use it to bind Bond's feet and hands. And then they pitch him over the railing of the catwalk onto the conveyor belt into the like the shredding machine. At this point, Truman Lodge is like, what are you doing, Sanchez? We've got a thirty two million dollar investment in this facility. Can you please focus on the fire <laughs> and the drugs and not this stupid betrayal? Like, get your eyes on the prize here, please. Sanchez is like, whatever. It's 
only money we can always make more 32 million dollars of course was the budget of the movie (laughs) so he doesn't care that much he also has half a billion dollars in the briefcase he's carrying (laughs) that's right like he's got tons of money so he's like get the tankers out of here whatever but this is not a problem and truman lodge is not convinced by this argument because they're like listen we already have the money from these investors and if we can't make good on the promise that we have made them we will be in trouble sanchez is like whatever It doesn't matter. We can fix this. Just get out of here. We'll worry about that later. Then they heave Bond onto the conveyor belt as the truck's full of gasoline and all the investors and scientists run away. Sanchez tells Heller to go and make sure that the helicopter is ready. So Heller runs off. Truman Lodge runs off and Bond is still trying to sow seeds of discord here because, you know, anything to have Sanchez not kill him. Mm -hmm. And he's like, what about the Stinger missiles? Sanchez is like, how do you know about that? And he's like, well, you're never going to see them or Heller again. (laughs) Yeah. And so he's like, so who's got your $500 million? Truman Lodge. Do you think you'll see that money again? Meanwhile, like as this is happening, Bond keeps grabbing at the railing to stop himself from going down the conveyor belt. And Sanchez keeps walking up and like stomping his fingers Mm -hmm. to make him let go. Until he mentions the missiles. He pauses it briefly, but then starts it back up again. Bond goes over the edge of the conveyor belt, manages at the last second to like hook the rope that's around his wrists on a like hook at the end of the conveyor belt. So he's like dangling by this rope (laughs) over the shredding machine as like kilograms of cocaine are still going down this conveyor belt, like pelting him in the shoulder and falling into this machine. Sanchez like goes off to, to go get on the helicopter. Dario stays behind and sees that Bond has managed to avoid falling into the machine. So he then pulls out a switchblade knife and steps out onto the conveyor belt, sort of bracing his feet on either side of it as he reaches down and begins to cut the rope that Bond is suspended by, spitting in Bond's face in the process. As the fire doors are coming down, Pam manages to sneak into the hangar while she's still wearing this white robe that she stole from Professor Joe's room. And there's this shot of her like backlit and bathed in light appearing like unto a Christ figure (laughs) to (laughs) rescue James Bond. It's definitely played for visual jokes. Oh yeah. She arrives just as the rope is finally cut. Dario spots her and starts to laugh. He just taunts her. He's just like, you're dead. And she says, you took the words right out of my mouth and shoots him. And that knocks him over, but her gun jams. And it doesn't kill him. But Bond, who, like, his rope has just been cut, but he's managed to grab on with his hands, takes advantage of this moment to grab Dario's leg, knocking him off balance onto the conveyor belt, and Dario is sucked into the shredder machine. It's pretty grim. It's... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it's gruesome. It's gruesome to think about, but the actual depiction of it on film is quite tasteful. Mm. We get an underside shot of the thing with a few little giblets appearing, but the overwhelming majority of it is as he goes through the machine, the cocaine dust is pink. Oh. <laughs> So Bond is hanging there and (laughs) Pam is like, are you all right? And he's like, shut the bloody machine off. (laughs) With a panicked look on his face. It's quite good. So then we cut back to the helicopter where Heller is unloading Stinger missiles onto onto a forklift just as Sanchez arrives. Sanchez is immediately suspicious. Heller says, I'm just making sure these are secure. Sanchez is like, well, that's a good idea. Take them to my car. Having been rescued by Pam, Bond and Pam try to escape, but of course all the fire doors have closed and the whole facility is exploding around them. So they're desperately looking for an exit when conveniently a forklift busts through the wall, creating a hole. Inconveniently for Heller, the forklift has impaled him and Heller is no more. Bond makes a quip that doesn't really land saying, oh, it looks like he met a dead end. Uh, And then they bolt through the hole that the forklift has created in the wall, escaping the facility. And we cut back to Sanchez, who is surveying the Stinger missiles that have been loaded into his car. And he grabs an Uzi (laughs) out of the missile case and sits down in the back of the car as his driver drives away. Truman Lodge, of course, is running around the facility in a panic. Sanchez pulls up, seeing Truman Lodge running away in a panic, and just says, you, you ride with me. (laughs) Which 
Truman Lodge does not look thrilled about the idea of doing, but he does get in. At this point, Bond and Pam have escaped and are, are outside the facility. Bond is sort of trying to figure out what to do as he's seeing all the people he's been chasing run away. Pam has found a golf cart. And so she drives up and picks Bond up in the golf cart and they make their way to the exit. And on their way to the exit, who should they find but Dr. Joe Butcher running away from this facility, bag of money in hand. And she just reaches out and grabs the bag from him and continues driving. And Joe calls out from behind, bless your heart. <laughs> So now comes the big action set piece. Bond and Pam pull up to the crop duster, ready to make their escape. But rather than making their escape, what they do is they find the tanker trucks full of gas. And Bond asks Pam to pull up over top of one of the tanker trucks and drop him off. And so he jumps out the side of the plane and lands on top of one of these tanker trucks. And we have what is almost like a full-blown Mad Max situation as Bond is like scaling the roof of a tanker truck trying to get up to the front. Sanchez in his car spots him and is like leaning out the side of the car, shooting his Uzi at the truck, trying to hit Bond and like Bond falls underneath into the space between the cabin and the trailer and ends up like dragging his heels on the ground. He does eventually make it up to the front of the truck and into the cabin of the truck where the truck driver like pulls a Bowie knife out of the sun visor <laughs> and starts like winging the knife at Bond. Bond manages to punch the driver and then hit him with a fire extinguisher to blind him before hurling him out the door onto Sanchez's car. Sanchez's driver just grabs the guy and hefts him off the hood of the car. And so now Bond is in control of a tanker truck, which is following Sanchez's car. And we have some tanker truck based hijinks as Bond tries to jockey for position with the other tanker trucks. And they end up side by side going around a corner as like a random vehicle with two people and a dog and a cargo load of pineapples is driving along. And he, he manages to like duck his tanker truck out of the way. And while all this is happening, Sanchez pulls his car over to the side of the road, goes to the trunk and opens a weapons case and pulls out a Stinger missile, much to the horror of Truman Lodge, who is still concerned about the cost of everything that's going on here. Because at this point, Sanchez is indicating that he is going to fire a Stinger missile itself worth a huge amount of money at one of their own tankers full of cocaine gas. <laughs> also worth a huge amount of money. Bond manages to crash one of the other trucks, and Sanchez's goons have at this point driven down to, or walked down to the lower, because like, they're on a sort of like switchback road. They've walked down to the next switchback, and they take aim at Bond's tanker truck with the Stinger missiles. Here we come to what I would describe as the signature stunt of this film. Remember, way back in the day, when Bond drove a sports car on two wheels? Uh, yep. Well, wouldn't it be sweet if he did that in an 18-wheeler? <laughs> Bond, seeing that he's about to be shot at by a Stinger missile, drives his truck up onto some construction equipment, lifting one side of the truck up off the ground, and drives this tanker truck diagonally down the road, just in time for the Stinger missile to shoot right underneath the wheels of the truck and into the tanker truck behind him that he crashed, blowing up that load of gasoline. Bond manages to keep the 18-wheeler rolling up to where their jeep is, where they're, they're stopped with this missile, and the goons all see what's about to happen. So they all take off running. Bond writes the truck back onto all of its wheels right on top of the jeep that they had been driving, smashing it into the ground. This is a very sweet stunt. The stunt rules. The best part about this stunt is that all these trucks were provided by Kenworth. And there's an amazing special feature actually on the DVD of like a corporate back patting video made by Kenworth from the era of like, look at our trucks featured in this James Bond movie. Here's how we did it. And the special changes that they made to some of them at the behest of Remy Julien, who's the man in charge of all the car stunts. So there's the one that was altered specially so that it could pop a wheelie 
and there was the one that was altered so that Carrie Lowell could drive it, which was done by building another driving seat in the cab, like in the bed area behind the driver's seat. There's a full like wheel and gear shift and pedals and everything hidden back there that not only drove the truck with Carrie Lowell sitting in front of that person in the driver's seat, but that also mirrored all of the pedal and wheel motion. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, it was incredibly rigged. And they did make a rig with like some special weights and supports and everything that would assist in this stunt, the truck going up on like a 45 degree angle. Right. But they didn't need it because Remy Julian is some kind of superhero. <laughs> And they just did this. It looks so good. This stunt is nuts. It is exactly what it sounds like. It is driving an 18 wheeler for 50 to 100 meters at a 45 degree angle because you can. Also, the bit with him crashing the other truck and then that truck gets blown up. So that wasn't originally intended. Oh, <laughs> when they were doing the like bumping into one another thing. I don't know how it was originally supposed to go, but the truck like bumped the other one a little too hard and it smashed into the rock wall and the whole cab just got completely destroyed. And that wasn't meant to happen. But they were like, man, that looked really cool. Right. Let's slightly rewrite what's about to happen. That makes sense because there's a couple of like minor continuity issues in this scene in terms of like the geography of the scene. Mm. But the continuity issues don't matter even a little bit because this whole sequence is rad. <laughs> Anyhow, Bond then lands his truck, drives away. The goons proceed to start shooting at him and they blow out his rear wheels. This causes the truck to skid out as he goes around the next corner. So he brings the truck to a stop with like the back half of the tanker hanging off this cliff. Just as Pam comes around in the crop duster and crop dusts all the goons, giving Bond a moment to do anything. Of course, he's at the top of the switchback. On the switchback below, the other two tanker trucks are driving along. So Bond just releases the load and his tanker rolls down the mountain and crashes into one of the other tanker trucks in front of him, blowing both of them up. Sanchez's car pulls over and Truman Lodge is just beside himself being like, oh, great, great. This is awesome. This is super great. Look at all this money we're losing. Well, now what? Now what, genius? And Sanchez is like, yeah, you're right. Maybe we should start cutting some overhead and just kills him. <laughs> so Dario was killed by a combination of Bond and Pam. Yeah. But everyone else inside Sanchez's organization was killed by him. Yeah. Which is great. Yes. So having now released his load, Bond gets back in the cab and takes off driving as the goons all pile into a pickup truck that's giving chase. Bond comes around the switchback as the two tankers that had collided with each other previously erupt in this enormous fireball, which, of course, blocks the road in front of Bond. Bond pulls his cab up to the like wall of flame realizes that he's being pursued by this pickup truck full of dudes with machine guns and pops a wheelie in his 18 wheeler to get his front tires above the flames wheelies through the flames setting back down on the other side and carrying on the folks in the pickup truck chasing him see this and decide to drive through it lighting their entire truck on fire oh god this is a very silly stunt because it's quite clear that an 18-wheeler cab can't pop a wheelie and that this cab has been altered to be able to do so. But my favorite touch in this stunt is Bond rolling up the window. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's a manual window, so he's like, the truck is already in a wheelie driving through the fire and Bond has got one hand on the wheel and you can see him like spinning the knob in the door <laughs> as the window goes up. Uh... His cab catches up with the final truck of the four that initially started, and he gets out onto the hood of his cab and jumps to the ladder on the back of that truck and opens the valve, spraying cocaine gas all over the street as the pickup truck chasing him with the one burning wheel drives through it, thereby setting the whole thing alight making their truck even more engulfed in flames and causing them to fly off a cliff right past Pam in her plane. It looks like they're about to collide, but the plane is some distance in front. But they got an amazing angle on the shot that it, they pass through the same area of frame. It's really cool. Yeah, it's awesome. 
So now all the gasoline's gone. Yep. And Bond climbs up onto the back of the truck and Sanchez in the passenger seat aims the Stinger missile launcher out the window. Sanchez is beyond all reason at this point. He is just needs to kill this guy. Yeah. Pam flies her plane in to, I don't know, try and give Bond air support, I guess. Sanchez fires the Stinger missile, of course, misses Bond, but it goes through the tail of Pam's plane, causing her to fly off course. So they stop the truck. Bond flies forward and ends up between the cab and the tanker. Sanchez rushes out with a machete, sees Bond there, takes a swipe at him, misses, but cuts the hydraulic line for the brakes. (laughs) So the truck just starts rolling away down the hill. Sanchez gets to the back, jumps up the ladder. Now he and Bond are on top of this tanker. Pam lands the plane, driving through some rocks that clip the wings off, and finds herself near the empty runaway truck cab that Bond had previously abandoned, coming to a stop at the bottom of a canyon. So she's like, oh, great, that's handy. (laughs) Bond and Sanchez are now having a fist versus machete fight on the back side and top of this tanker that is running away, heading down a hill. The driver is tired of trying to keep it on the road and just bails. (laughs) He just leaps out. It's great. And the tanker tumbles down sideways down a cliff. And it's sort of like, how are they living through that? The answer is barely. (laughs) Yeah. Bond and Sanchez struggle to come to. Sanchez, who was lower on the ladder at the back, is doused in gasoline. But they're both looking pretty badly injured. Bond struggles to get to his feet, but is met with Sanchez, who is already on his feet with a machete, who picks him up, lays him down on a rock so that he can kill him with the machete. And just as he swings back, Bond says, don't you want to know why? And Sanchez pauses because he does want to know why. Why did this guy have such a vendetta against him? Right. And Bond shows him the lighter, the genuine Felix lighter. Not that Sanchez would have any understanding of what that lighter indicates. Well, he probably knows who Felix is because he knows Felix's house. Do you think he can see the inscription on the lighter from five feet away? Probably not. But luckily, it is that lighter that has the comical ignition. And so Bond shows him the lighter, then flicks the lighter. It bursts with fire out at Sanchez, completely igniting him as he is engulfed in gasoline. And he runs flailing away from Bond towards the back end of the tanker, still leaking gas. Bond runs away as it absolutely explodes. And there's an amazing shot with literal Timothy Dalton in the foreground. (laughs) (laughs) As this colossal explosion goes off. Yeah, it's like they blew up a tanker truck full of gasoline. (laughs) They spared no expense on the fireballs in this movie. I can't believe they let Timothy Dalton actually be the one in that shot. But it's amazing. (laughs) Yeah. So fireball done. Pam pulls up in the discarded truck. Says, what are you waiting for? Get in. And Bond says, yes, sir. And gets in and they drive off. Cut to Felix Leiter, alive, feeling a little bit better, in surprisingly high spirits for a man that just had his wife killed on their wedding night. That bothers me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was, it's been like maybe a week, maybe. Yeah. The last five minutes of this film really failed to hit the mark for me. Yeah. It looks like they saved the arm. So, you know, that's nice. But like Felix is not only in high spirits, he's talking about going fishing next week. With who? Your fishing charter guy also got murdered. Do you not have more important things to worry about next week? Planning a funeral? Getting your affairs in order? Maybe he's laughing through the pain. (laughs) Bond, for his part, is in a tux at a party. Along with everybody else. What is the basis of this party? It's not clear. They're they're at his estate, like they're at the Sanchez estate, which does not feel like a place they would be welcome. I guess maybe it's like a state party because the president is there and it looks like the president and Lupe maybe hit it off, which is also kind of weird. But I guess it's sort of like a hooray, we're free of Sanchez party. Maybe, I guess. I guess. So yeah, Pam is there and Q is there and they share a toast and Lupe approaches him with Sanchez Iguana, whose necklace she is now wearing as a bracelet. Lupe makes makes a move on Bond and I mean Bond doesn't stop Lupe and Pam sees this gets jealous and runs off in a huff and even the amazing wingman powers of Q cannot help (laughs) 
But Bon notices and excuses himself from Lupe and sees Pam running away past the pool with a tear in her eye, you know, jilted. And so Bond leaps off the balcony into the pool that Pam is standing beside and swims over as she gets this, oh, James, look on her face. And he pulls her into the pool and they start making out in the pool. And I'm pretty sure Q has a quip. I think Q just shakes his head and then downs an entire drink. That is exactly what happens. Yes. Bond and Pam start to smooch and the camera pans over to a goofy fish fountain with a light eye that blinks as the final credit song begins to play. I definitely agree with you about the ending of this movie kind of muddying the landing. Yeah, it whiffs the ball pretty bad. (laughs) But man, everything before that last five minutes is real good. Totally inconsistent, but really entertaining. And that was License to Kill. So what did you think? I thought it was great. I really liked it. There was the one or two things I mentioned as we were talking that were like, "Mm, that doesn't really quite make sense. And the ending is like sort of out of tone with the rest of it. But ultimately, it's a really excellent action movie of its era. Yeah. That has a lot of sections, long sections that like don't feel particularly like a James Bond movie. And I'm having difficulty articulating exactly what that means. Like, I don't know what a James Bond movie is, but I know it when I see it. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the sort of thing we're operating on. Yeah, but I completely know what you mean. Like, it's a revenge movie. He's operating off the grid. It's not a, like, statecraft spy movie. It's him going up against a drug dealer. (laughs) The spy craft in it is mostly really good, but it, like, the stakes are a lot smaller. Like, he's not really saving the world. He's just preventing a drug deal. It doesn't feel like the kind of caper that Bond gets up to. Yeah. We've given our base opinions of this film. Let's start ranking things. Where does the pre-title rate for you? It's really good. And we mentioned this earlier in the episode, but despite my feelings about the rest of the movie, the pre-title feels very James Bond. There's action. There's serious moments. It's lighthearted. There's an amazing stunt. It sets up the movie like there's a lot of things it really hits very well. If you had to rate it, where would you rate it? Well, I do have to rate it. And that's the problem. (laughs) (laughs) I'm I'm trying to figure that out right now. Well, I have a pretty good idea where it's going to go. I think this is one of the all time greats. Wow. Quite honestly, I think this is one of the all time greats. Is it better than you only live twice? Hell yeah. Easy. (laughs) Is it better than Moonraker? Maybe. Is it better than The Spy Who Loved Me? Baby, those are both really great stunts. Is it better than From Russia With Love? Are we finally going to unseat From Russia With Love and the fake out Bond death? Maybe. Like, I think this fits in my top three. The stunt is exceptional. It is the most Bondy feeling part of this movie by a wide margin. This is the point where I'm doing the thing that you've mentioned before, where I sort of look at my list as it stands and go, what was I thinking before when I did these things? (laughs) And the first thing you said was because you were looking at your number four. Is it better than you only live twice? And I think it is. But for me, you only live twice is my number two. So I think this is my new number two. (laughs) This one is my new number two as well. It's great action. It's cool stunt work. It is story related. Like there's actually like a narrative arc within the scene and it ties into the greater story of the film in a like really meaningful way i would almost be willing to put this above from russia with love but i think the hook in from russia with love is the pinnacle so far all right title song it's nice to have a belter again the musical accompaniment is decidedly 1980s and i don't strictly mean that as a compliment it's not high on my list but i like it i think that's fair i've already decided where i'm putting it where's that I think this goes above Nobody Does It Better, below For Your Eyes Only. That's fair. I'm going to put it in the exact same location. (laughs) But for me, it's above (laughs) Look of Love and below the better belter of Moonraker. All right. To me, the better belter. You have Moonraker lower. And the film overall. Man, I don't know. It's really messing me up. (laughs) It's good. It's a good movie. It's an entertaining movie. Everyone in it is great. The plot is good. The cinematography is good. The pacing is good. The stunts are great. There's miniatures. The sets are amazing. Yeah. And it has that stupid fish statue. (laughs) And it has that stupid fish statue. This one's a tough one for me, too. 
I think this goes between Living Daylights and View to a Kill for me. All right. I think Living Daylights is a better Bond movie, and I think it's better natured. Mm -hmm. This one is just kind of gruesome and grim in places in a way that's like grisly rather than fun. Yeah, and I don't like that, honestly. I have to treat it in the lens of what I'm looking for in a Bond film. And I'm not looking for Felix Leiter having his leg taken off by sharks and his wife murdered. And the ways in which this movie sort of fails to hold the line on just like fully committing to that bit <laughs> where it arcs back and they're like no but we have to be a bond movie bond has to get the girl at the end remember when like bond had some sort of catharsis at the death of his wife <laughs> But Felix Leiter doesn't get that. I mean, it's natural in a Bond movie that the only character that matters in a Bond movie is James Bond. But I still feel like with a character with as much legacy across these movies as Felix, that just having it like, and everybody lived happily ever after at the end, it's such a swing and a miss. Everything else about this movie is great, but the, the little things that aren't great about this movie really damage it. Yeah, I think that's fair. And I also think that Living Daylights is a better take at we've got to make this 1980s James Bond more gritty. Yeah. Like that feels like a modern gritty James Bond. And this feels like a 1980s action movie that occasionally is like, oh, got to get James Bond stuff in there. I, I agree completely. Like, I think I commented in the Living Daylights episode is the reputation for Timothy Dalton is he's the Bond that's not funny. But he, it's not true. In Living Daylights, he has lots of funny lines. There's humor in that movie. And sometimes it's like cutting barbs or whatever, but it's pithy. Whereas this one is much more serious and much more grim. And where it aims for levity, it mostly feels silly. Where it did in living daylights it felt appropriate in living daylights <sighs> yeah it's definitely it is also below living daylights for me i'm actually putting this further down the list i'm gonna put this below you only live twice with the understanding that it's really good and i like it a lot i like everything on this list we've been through that but it just it doesn't hit the james bond notes for me as much you know this is not if i'm like oh i really want to watch a james bond movie i'm not gonna nestle in on the couch and load up license to kill exactly that was sort of where i drew the line too is like what would i prefer to sit down and watch at any given moment if i'm gonna watch a bond movie yeah but you know you, you say we, we like all these movies and and we're putting these quite low down on our list but we've rated 18 bond movies so far and i would say that our break point for where and actually like bad movie is is somewhere between slots 14 and 18 right like anything above that line is still in our category of good or at least okay to good even in those last four there are not many movies that i would categorically say are bad movies short of casino royale yeah definitely did you have a bond moment that you wanted to call out that you haven't already Yes, all the stuff with him in the casino is great, where he's trying to be a dickwad. But I appreciate the bit with M, because it again, it feels the most James Bond that he's there with M when he says, uh, this is a farewell to arms then, because he's buying time to formulate exactly how he's going to attack M and these other two agents and make his escape while not being shot by the guy in the tower by stalling, by making like an appropriate quip mm -hmm. for the moment and the location. And I quite like like that my bond moment for this movie is him startling the pigeon <laughs> because he did it again <laughs> uh thanks john glenn and i guess that will bring us to an end it will next time we come back to you after six years of legal and financial troubles at mgm and united artists with 1995's goldeneye the first pierce brosnan bond movie and I want to say the first one I ever saw. Oh, wow. That's quite impressive. It was definitely not the first one I ever saw, but it is one of my like fond favorites. I mean, Goldeneye casts a long shadow across pop culture of its day. So I, we shouldn't get too deep into this, but I do vaguely recall that the last time I watched it, I felt it hadn't aged as well as it like in reality as it had in my mind. But I am looking forward to digging in to this one because Brosnan was the bond of my generation, I guess. He would have been for a long time the bond that I claimed as my favorite bond. I don't think that's true anymore, but I have a lot of fond associations with Goldeneye specifically. So we'll see how those bear out next week. Yeah. So until then, I want to thank you, Matt, always for doing this show with me. And I want to shout out to Featherweight for the awesome art, Matt Griffiths for the wonderful work with the video version of this podcast. 
And of course, Heather, who does podcast admin for us and all of you for listening, for your comments, for telling your friends. And for those of you who support us directly over at Patreon at patreon.com slash loading ready run. So until then, this podcast will return. Mm-hmm.